Good afternoon, everyone. May we remind everyone to please refrain from using the chat box for inappropriate comments. Upon entering the Zoom, please make sure that audio and camera are turned off. If you would like to participate, please use the Q&A tab below and wait for the moderator to call you. Furthermore, we encourage everyone to tweet and post your insights all throughout the webinar. When posting, kindly use the hashtag, hashtag DefendDemocracy and hashtag CourageOn. Please stand by as we will begin in a few minutes. Before we formally begin, let us start with an opening prayer to be led by Elijah Richmond A. Gales, the Director for National Affairs of the Office of the President and Director for Internal Linkages under the hashtag DefendDemocracy event. After which, please remain silent for the Philippine National Anthem. Let us remember that we, we are in the most holy presence of God in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing our country with people who have a compassionate heart to fight for the welfare of our fellow Filipinos. We thank you for blessing them with brilliant minds that are used to cater to the needs of the people, especially the most vulnerable. May you always continue to guide them. Touch the hearts of the leaders of our country and bless them with the courage to change the things they can and wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong. Continue to heal our land from the wounds of injustice and may you cast out the spirit of fear that has gripped the hearts and minds of many Filipinos. Help us see our collective power to build a nation centered in social justice, human rights, and democracy. All together, our Lasallian prayer, I'll continue, O oh my God, to do all my actions for the love of you. St. John Baptist de La Salle, pray for us. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. We would like to welcome you to today's Hashtag Defend Democracy, the effects of the anti-terror law on dissenters and communities. I am Calvin Almazan, Chief Policy Advisor of the Office of the President of the DLSU USG. And I am Kat Duyan, the Batch Vice President of Blaze 2022, and we are your hosts for today's event. Today, we will be having talks on the different pressing political issues in Philippine society, particularly the anti-terror law and its effects on the people. But before that, Calvin, what is Hashtag Defend Democracy? Great question, Kath. Actually, Hashtag Defend Democracy was conceptualized to commemorate the anniversary of the signing of the anti-terror law. As we know, mm -hmm. since its passing, numerous petitions have been passed in the Supreme Court to nullify the law for its encroachment onto basic human rights. The first installment of hashtag Defend Democracy today will actually be a situationer. So we will be having key representatives from the different sectors to provide us or present to us how the anti-terror law has affected them since. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, from what you said, no, Calvin, I think it's very obvious na walang pinipili ang anti-terror law at ang bawat tao ay apektado. And because of that, we indeed have a lot to discuss today and tomorrow. Now, without further ado, kindly sit back as we welcome Ms. Prissy De Vera, the Vice President or La Salian Mission of the La Salle University for her opening remarks. Hey, thanks to everyone and I welcome you all to a two-day forum entitled Defend Democracy. I would like to thank our university student government, uh, COSCA, the Office of Student Life, and our partner, Rappler, Move PH, for organizing this very important and timely conversations on our current human rights situation in our country and the impact of the anti-terror law on the different sectors of society. In recent years, the political climate in the Philippines has been tumultuous. In fact, uh, the Philippines is ranked number 56 in the recent Freedom in the World report so this is a report documenting each country and territory's degree of political freedom and civil liberties and is classified as partly free out of 210 countries and territories. Needless to say, the pandemic has magnified the issues that beset our troubled democracy, especially as the shutdown of ABS-CBN and the anti-terror law were fast-tracked in Congress last year. So one would wonder, is this the sunset of our democracy? A great Lasallian Ka Pepe Diokno once said, and I quote, Law in the land died. I grieve for it, but I do not despair over it. I know with a certainty, no argument can turn, no wind can shake that from its dust will rise a new and better law, more just, more human, and more humane. When that will happen, I know not. That it will happen, I know. End of quote. If democracy is not free, then we must all work hard to defend and nurture it vigorously. Fighting for democracy can be a lonesome and tiring battle. But I remain hopeful because there are people who muster the courage to resist despite insurmountable odds. Many of you in attendance are students who are equipped with the gifts of your age, creativity, wit, and agility. More than any other generation, Yours has sparked global movements that have changed the landscape of activism. Please use them well. To sit and listen in the discussions in the next two days is an important step for us to situate ourselves within the current political context of our country. But most importantly, when this is done, we must take concrete steps in guaranteeing the victory of the democratic ideals that we strive to achieve. We must heed the call to action, more so with the looming national elections in 2022, which requires to have a more critical, intensified and inclusive grassroots involvement and multi-sectoral engagements and making sure that we uphold the freedoms of a democratic society. Let us equip ourselves well for the battle ahead. Thank you very much to everyone. And may you have a fruitful and meaningful discussions ahead. As Ms. Fritzi said, we must heed the call to action. If democracy is not free, then we have to nurture and defend it vigorously. Thank you for the warm welcome, Ms. Fritzi. But wait, there's more. If you notice, this event has external partners as well. With this, we have another keynote speech from one of the most respected Filipino journalists of this time. 
Please stay focused on your screen while we watch this keynote speech. Hello, everybody. Over the next two days, you'll focus on the government's latest initiative to stifle our freedoms and intimidate us to silence. So let me give you the context for everything you'll be discussing, right? I have three points I want to share with you. First, what's it like to be a journalist under attack? Second, I'll define the problem. And finally, share the principles we're using to live our way into the solution because we really must, right? So the context. Um, for the sixth year in a row, Filipinos spent the most time online and on social media globally. 100% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook, according to Hootsuite, and we are social. YouTube this year overtook Facebook as the top social media site in our country. And because of the pandemic, new users are coming online in Southeast Asia at a blistering pace, adding 40 million new internet users last year, compared to 100 million the previous five years. As all this is happening, it's getting harder and harder to hold power to account. In less than two years, the Philippine government filed 10 arrest warrants against me. That's 10 criminal charges, 10 times I posted bail because I'm doing my job as a journalist. The methodology is the same for those of you red tagged as it is for Stop the Steal in the United States, right? Election fraud, it is the, the social media attacks pound you exponentially bottom up the lies, the meta narratives before the government in Rappler's case, President Duterte himself came top down, parang bibingka, di ba? Then the weaponization of the law. Last year, a former colleague and I were convicted of cyber libel for a story we published eight years earlier at the time when the crime we allegedly violated didn't even exist. All told, those charges carry a cumulative penalty of more than 100 years in prison. I could go to jail for the rest of my life, right? This is crazy. <laughs> but look, it's not all bad. I bring three strands together that help me find the way forward. First, I head Rappler's business and tech, so I'm forced to evaluate the changes and to build for the future. Second, I'm an investigative journalist. This is my 35th year as a journalist, and you know that hasn't changed. I know why we do what we do. And finally, because I'm the target of attacks online and in the real world, I get to see these evolving tactics and to tell you about them. On International Women's Day this year, the International Center for Journalists and UNESCO analyzed nearly half a million social media posts and showed that 60% of these were aimed to tear down my credibility, to tear down trust in rappers reporting. The other 40% are visceral, they're personal, sexist, misogynistic attacks that are meant to not just make me feel bad, but meant to pound me to silence. Well. As you can see, that's not working. But this brings us to the problem we need to solve. And it's, it's a quote from an American biologist, E.O. Wilson. He said, we're facing paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Social media has become a behavior modification system. And we are Pavlov's dogs experimented on in real time with disastrous consequences. We're being insidiously manipulated. Facebook is the world's largest distributor of news, and yet studies have shown that lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further than really boring facts. The very platforms that deliver the facts to you are biased against facts, biased against journalists. They are, by design, dividing us and radicalizing us. In today's world, a lie told a million times becomes a fact. This person is a terrorist, pound a million times, right? Now, if you don't know what to believe, you don't have facts. Without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without any of these three, democracy as we know it, and beyond that, all meaningful human endeavor becomes impossible. Without facts, we have no shared reality, and it becomes impossible to tackle the existential problems we face. Climate change, right? That was the first community we built in Rappler. Coronavirus, 
the battle for truth. As we face the coronavirus, there's an equally dangerous and insidious virus of lies unleashed in our information ecosystem. These are called meta narratives. In my case, journalist equals criminal, right? In, in the Stop the Steal in the US, it was that there was election fraud. These are seeded by power, wanting to stay in power, spread by algorithms motivated by profit, a business model Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. The reward is your attention. And it is linked to not just political power here, but also geopolitical power. I mean, early this year, the EU slammed Russia and China for their intensified vaccine disinformation campaigns. And last September, Facebook took down information operations from China that were campaigning for Sara Duterte for president that early, right? Creating fake accounts for the US elections and attacking me and rapper. As we've seen here in other parts of the world, what happens on social media doesn't stay on social media. Online violence leads to real world violence. So let's go to the one year. Around the same time that Hong Kong passed its draconian security law and we're watching what's happening there, the Philippines passed its anti-terror law. That sparked 37 petitions at the Supreme Court to declare it unconstitutional. It's been a year. Under that law, and you'll hear this from everyone in the next two days, anyone some cabinet secretaries call a terrorist could be arrested without a warrant and jailed for up to 24 days. This makes red tagging, what, or when a government calls a journalist, a human rights activist, or opposition politician a terrorist, it's even more dangerous. Now the police apply for and they get arrest warrants. Hopefully that's no long, longer the case, but March this year, the police barged early morning into the homes of red tagged activists and killed nine in a day. Let's end with a fact about the lawyers who defend us in court. More lawyers have died under the Duterte administration than in the 44 years before he took office. So what do we do? Well, we at Rappler focus on three pillars, right? Technology, journalism, and community. On technology, we have two initiatives. I'm working very hard with global groups to find regulations that will leave the best and put guardrails on the worst of tech's insidious manipulations. Last year, I co-chaired the Infodemics Working Group with former EU Parliament member Marika Shakit. She's now with Stanford. In our paper released by the Forum on Information Democracy last November, we recommended a dozen systemic solutions and more than 250 tactical steps. I'm watching closely the evolution of the EU's Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, the UK's online harms bill, the US debate on Section 230. Separately, we at Grappler are building our own tech platform that protects the public sphere, that protects the facts. We called it Lighthouse and we rolled it out last year. We continue to build, not just for distribution, but for communities to grow around facts and evidence-based reasoning. Well, you know what we're doing with journalism and community. When we created Rappler in 2012, my elevator pitch was simple. We build communities of action. The food we feed our communities is journalism. The mission of journalism is even more important today. And we know that we need to hold power to account, whether it is the Philippine government or Facebook. Our community, you have not only rallied around us, our community has given us money to help pay our legal fees. This is a community that continues to inspire us to keep holding the line. It's been five years, and I know what I'm willing to sacrifice for the facts. I know what I'm willing to sacrifice for the truth. So I ask each of you watching today to ask yourself that same question that we Rapplers had to confront. And many of you here have given up, have sacrificed far more. What are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? and act now. Thanks so much for listening. A million times becomes a fact. Powerful yet true to life words that speak the truth of today's attacks towards journalists and truth tellers. 
words that speak a lot of how fake news is pounding those who tell the truth into submission. We are grateful for the time Ms. Maria Reza has given us today, and we admire her strength and perseverance amidst the attacks she is facing. Truly, what an honor to be graced by two highly respectable people whom the Lasallian community takes inspiration from. And this is just the beginning. Indeed, Kat, we have a lot more in store for our viewers today. To finally start the event proper, let us welcome our first speaker who will be presenting human rights violations and in particular issues of human rights violations under the anti-terror law. She is currently a commissioner of the Commission on Human Rights. Let us welcome Honorable Karen S. Gomez Dumpe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Calvin, and thank you. A pleasant afternoon to everyone. Uh, before I begin, allow me to express my thanks, of course, to De La Salle University, Manila University Student Government, Move PH, Rappler, for this invitation to speak in this online forum today. I'd like to request the slides to be presented now. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. This afternoon, I will talk to you about human rights implications of the anti-terror law, which was enacted a little over a year ago despite strong opposition from various sectors. In the next 20 minutes, let me share with you the human rights implications of some of the provisions of this law and how it has led to violations of rights of individuals and groups. Next slide, please. I start by giving you a brief overview of human rights, uh, since this will frame my discussion this afternoon. While there is no single definition of what human rights are, they are generally defined as universal legal guarantees protecting individuals and groups against actions that interfere with their fundamental rights and human dignity. Note that human dignity is at the core of human rights. As a general principle, international human rights law places human rights obligations upon states and state actors. Next slide is on human rights principles. It's important to understand some of the most basic principles of human rights as these give us a better understanding of what they are. In the interest of time, let me breeze through them with hopes that I do not oversimplify them. Human rights are universal. They ought to be enjoyed by all persons everywhere in the world. Human rights are inherent to all human beings, regardless of race, sex, nationality, ethnicity, language, religion, or any other status. Human rights are inalienable and cannot be conveyed or transferred to another. Human rights are indivisible and interrelated. Each one contributes to the realization of a person's human dignity through the satisfaction of his or her developmental, physical, psychological, and spiritual needs. The fulfillment of one right often depends wholly or in part upon the fulfillment of others. All individuals are equal as human beings and by virtue of the inherent dignity of each human person. No one, therefore, should suffer discrimination on the basis of race, color, ethnicity, gender, age, language, sexual orientation, religion, political or other opinion, national, social or geographical origin, disability, property, birth or other status. Next slide, please. States have these three obligations under international human rights law. The obligation to respect means that states must refrain from interfering with or limiting the enjoyment of human rights. It has to abstain from violating human rights. The obligation to protect requires states to interfere in order to protect individuals and groups against human rights abuses by others in particular private actors. The obligation to fulfill means that states must take positive measures to facilitate the enjoyment of human rights. In the context of today's discussion, the Philippines as a state party to various human rights instruments is duty bound not to enact laws that would violate human rights. Next slide, please. 
Now let's focus on the anti-terror law or RA 11479, which was enacted last July 3, 2020. Soon after it was enacted, 37 petitions questioning the legality of the law were filed before the Supreme Court. Among the issues raised are violations of the Philippine Constitution and the country's international treaty commitments. These include human rights, which are both constitutionally guaranteed and contained in international human rights instruments. It's important to note that terrorism directly impacts the light, right to life, liberty, and security. Thus, counterterrorism measures must be put in place. These measures, however, must respect and protect human rights. Human rights and counterterrorism must complement and mutually reinforce each other. Now we go to some of the issues relating to the anti-terror law and their human rights implications. Next slide, please. The first major problem of the law lies in the definition of the law. The definition of terrorism is contained in this slide. So section four defines terrorism as acts done with intent to cause death or bodily harm or endanger a person's life, extensive destruction to the government or public facility or private property, and extensive, extensive damage to critical infrastructure. Terrorism is also committed by one who manufactures, possesses, acquires, transports, uses explosive, biological, nuclear, radiological, or chemical weapons or release of such dangerous substances or causing fire floods or explosions. Next slide. The definition of ter terrorism continued. Uh, the purpose of such act by its nature and context to intimidate the general public or a segment thereof, create an atmosphere or spread a message of fear or provoke or influenced by intimidation, the government or any international organization, or seriously destabilize or destroy the fundamental political, economic, or social structures of the country, or create a public emergency or seriously undermine public safety. Next slide. I will also include in this part, section nine, pertaining to inciting to commit terrorism, as its validity is inextricably linked to the definition of terrorism. And this section provides that any person who, without taking any direct part in the commission of terrorism, shall incite others to the execution of any acts specified in Section 4, hereof by means of speeches, proclamations, writings, emblems, banners, speeches, proclamations, um, are, again, um, uh, speeches or other representations tending to the same end. Next slide. Let me discuss some of the human rights implications of the vague definition. The vague definition violates due process as it gives no fair notice of what specific acts to avoid as it lacks the required sufficient precision. The definition also makes it difficult to distinguish an act of terrorism from ordinary crimes which are already punishable under the RPC and other pertinent laws. It produces a chilling effect on the exercise of fundamental rights and freedoms. It leads not only to filing and prosecution of offenses under the measure that should have been prosecuted as ordinary crimes, but also produces a chilling effect on the exercise of fundamental rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution and the international conventions such as free speech, expression, freedom of assembly, and freedom of association. It's open to abuse and misuse to target dissenters, critics of government, civil society organizations, human rights defenders, journalists, minority groups, labor activists, indigenous peoples, and members of the political opposition resulting to an unwarranted limitation and suppression on the right to organization, free speech, and the right to privacy. Next slide. The law allows law enforcement agencies to conduct surveillance on a person by mere suspicion, 
through the interception and recording of their private communications. This circumvents the right to privacy and may pave the way for phishing expeditions by government authorities violative of the right against unreasonable searches and seizures. It must be noted that interference with privacy must specify in detail the precise circumstances in which the interference is permitted and must not be implemented in a discriminatory manner. While profiling and surveillance may be legitimate activities, they must be done strictly within the bounds of law to prevent possible abuse. They cannot and should not be used as an instrument to intimidate, harass, repress individuals and groups. Next slide, please. As can be gleaned from this slide, the, this question is given to the Anti-Terror Council to designate an individual group, association, or organization as a terrorist and freezing of their assets upon probable cause. This is highly problematic as it unduly delegates what should be exclusively the function of the judiciary. Next slide. The provision on prescription in tw Section 26 of the law is a matter of concern as it allows upon application by the Department of Justice with the Court of Appeals, the preliminary, preliminary proscription of any group of persons or organizations or associations without a full hearing. Next slide. The freezing of assets can be seen as a violation of the right to property. Red tagging, labeling, and branding of individuals and organizations as leftist, communist, and terrorists have been used to silence those who dissent and are critical of the government. Through this piece of legislation, the government is given unhampered authority to silence dissent. Red tagging and labeling is a matter of serious concern that should not be taken lightly. Aside from its consequent delegitimization of dissent and public stigmatization, it is more often than not a prelude or even an open invitation for anyone to commit further atrocities against the person or organization tag. This practice delegitimizes dissent, causes public stigma, and invites anyone to commit further atrocities against the person's tag. The lack of full hearing in the proscription section is a violation of the right to due process as the parties involved may not be given a chance to be heard. Next slide. Section 29 of the law provides that any law enforcement agent or military personnel who has been authorized in writing by the ATC shall arrest and detain without warrant persons suspected of violating the law for a period of 14 calendar days, which period can be extended to a maximum of 10 days, a total of 24 if it is established that further detention is necessary to preserve evidence and prevent the commission of another terrorism. Next slide. Detention violated freedom of movement if the same is without cause or if due process is not followed. The prolonged detention of an individual suspected of committing terrorist acts or suspected of um, to be a member of a terrorist organization without judicial warrant and the denial of the right to post bail provided by the law does not only violate the period of detention allowed by the Constitution, but may also constitute cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. International standards prescribe that delays in bringing a person before the court must not exceed a few days and any delay longer than 48 hours should be justified by exceptional circumstances. It has treated delays of three or more days as a violation of Article 9, Paragraph 3 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Detention is arbitrary if the state continues to detain an individual beyond the period for which the state through its law enforcement officers can provide an appropriate justification. 
the provision absolves authorities of any criminal liability for the delay in the delivery of detained persons to the proper judicial authorities despite constitutional guarantees of presumption of innocence and due process. Next slide. Before I end, let me share with you my own experience of being red tagged. And this is a cause of concern given the anti-terror law. I also highlight its effects on human rights defenders, particularly women. Last year, as the OHCHR released its report on the Philippines, I have been very active on behalf of the commission in discussing the report with CSOs and in the process relative uh, the subsequent issuance of the resolution of the Human Rights Council on the situation of the Philippines. As CHR, we have contributed to the report, providing our own assessment of the human rights situation on the ground and our recommendations for government. During the interactive dialogue, we have expressed our continued commitment to monitor the human rights situation and to work with the OHCHR and the Philippine government to address the issues raised in the report. It is thus very unfortunate that in the course of my work as a commissioner, as a woman human rights defender, I have been subjected to attack. Our independence as a commission was questioned and we were referred to as termites. This really brings it home for us, the difficult work of women human rights defenders. And uh, of course, this is not to um, uh, measure it against how um, Maria Reza has experienced it. Um, uh, we are luckier by far not only because of what we do, but because also of who we are and the stereotypical gender roles accorded to us, we are being attacked as women human rights defenders. So to end, let me just highlight that the state has to adopt effective counter-terrorism measures in order to protect its sovereignty, national security, and peace and order against the threat of terrorism. And I end where I started. This must be done without compromising everyone's fundamental rights and freedoms. Effective counterterrorism measures and the protection of human rights are complementary and mutually reinforcing objectives. They must be pursued together as part of the state's duty to protect, respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. Maraming salamat po and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that very informative presentation, Honorable Gumpit. We are sorry for hearing the attacks against you, and we hope that you, along with the Commission, achieve justice. If I were to take out a portion from the presentation of Commissioner Karen and share it with our viewers, I'd like to highlight that human rights are universal, inherent to all human beings, inalienable, indivisible, interrelated, and non-discriminatory. With regards to the anti-terror law, we recognize that states must come up with means to curb terrorism. But as Commissioner Karen has said, we should never sacrifice human rights. And at the end of the day, our measures should, should protect them. We highly appreciate the Commissioner for the time she has spent with us today. That's right, Calvin. Indeed, na marami tayong natutunan kay Honorable Dumpit. And to keep the ball rolling, it is my honor to introduce our next speaker for today's webinar. Honorable Sarah Jane Ibanez Ilago is the first female representative of the Youth Party List, Kabataan, which is Filipino for Young People, in the House of Representatives of the Philippines. She served as the youngest lady legislator of Congress during her first term at just 26 years old. Let us all welcome Congresswoman Elago with a virtual round of applause. Hi, thank you, Kat and Calvin. Hi, po, kay Commissioner Karen Dumpit. A greetings of solidarity to all. A thank you, Girl SUSG, Rappler Youth PH, and Courage On for having this youth representation here at the hashtag Defend Democracy, the effects of ATL on the centers and communities. Higit sa maraming pasasalamat, aming pong pinapaabot ang aming pakikiisa sa lahat ng hindi bumibitaw sa laban ng kabataan at laban ng sambayan ng Pilipino para ipagtanggol ang karapatan at demokrasya sa ating bansa. I was invited to speak 
about the topic of the power of mobilizing the youth against red tagging of unspoken and critical student leaders and campus journalists. In fact, in August 2020, the Raptor research team specified the case of Kabata and Partilis in its in-depth report on the danger of state-sponsored disinformation. Indeed, with the anti-terror law in effect and uh, amid the backdrop of widespread human rights violations, uh, the worsening climate of impunity, red tagging threatens the lives, security of all those being targeted and singled out through red tagging, not to mention the amount of taxpayers' money wasted on fake quotes, manipulated images that incite hate and harm. Vocal critics and the opposition are often the targets of online and offline intimidation, including red tagging, where we are accused no, of being communist armed rebel fronts, were labeled as terrorists, and portrayed as threats to national security. Hindi lang po character assassination ang epekto, it's a virtual hit list, no, considering how red tagging led to harassment, intimidation, and uh, worse, um, killings. Let me start by sharing an overview of the effects of red tagging on the youth and our representation, and what the youth and students have done so far in calling to end red tagging. Youth and students being a very vocal on uh, the opposition to drug war killings, corruption, abuse of power, attacks on press freedom, and violations of human rights are increasingly being targeted and singled out through harassment and other attacks against this youth representation and other widely established schools and community-based youth and student organizations. I'm being targeted just for, for, just for performing my job as a youth party list representative. Student councils are being targeted for performing their obligation as student leaders. Campus journals are being targeted for performing their obligation as campus press. And as you can see in uh, the slides, you know, we have uh, suffered immensely from heavily propagated social media posts containing false claims, fabricated statements, yung mga pahayag na hindi ko talaga sasabihin, nakalagay dito sa mga kumakalat at nagiging viral pa ng mga posts, a red tagging, uh, which are all found no, to be linked uh, to the Philippine police and military according to a 2020 Facebook takedown of pages no, for coordinated and authentic behavior. Isang bagay po na pinapaimbestigahan natin ngayon no, sa, sa Kongreso. At dito lamang, labing dalawang senador no, across party lines nagtutulak na magkaroon na ng investigasyon dito sa mga reportedly mga government vaccine na mga troll farms. Napakahalaga po na hindi lang natin buksan no, yung investigasyon tungkol dyan, no, kundi magkaroon pa ng mas, mar mas maraming espasyo para pag-usapan no, yung lala, no, yung pintindi, yung lawak ng disinformation at uh, uh, yung pabigat din sa parte ng mga kabataan at ng ating mga kababayan kung paano po yung sobrang kinakailangan na pondo ng bayan para sana sa aid, mga financial assistance at marami pang ibang mga pangangailangan natin sa gitna ng pandemya. Imbis na ginagamit dito, no, dapat uh, doon na lang no, sa pangangailangan ng tao nilalaan. Uh, we are gravely concerned as um, even the chief of the Philippines' premier intelligence agency, Mika Director General Alex Paul Monteagudo, has a history of sharing false and misleading posts without verifying the source of information and the veracity of content. This is more troubling since Nika is the Secretariat of the Anti-Terrorism Council, which designates terrorists under the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, which is one of the most assailed law in our history. One of the most contentious provisions of the law, as, as discussed by Commissioner Karen, was the power of the APC to authorize law enforcers to arrest suspects without a warrant and detain them for as long as 24 days. Hence, uh, the pervasive practice of red tagging, terror tagging, and vilification 
against activists, dissenters, and the political opposition, threatens and violates the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to security. These violations have made the performance of our noble mandate as a youth partyless representative that is to raise the voices of the marginalized and the underrepresented sectors more dangerous. Incitement to hatred. Katulad po nung nakita niyo dun sa mga posts na talagang ah, grabe po no, yung, ah, yung mga bintang at ah, yung tindi ng mga pahayag na, na parang nagpapaypay ng apoy ng galit no, laban po sa aming representation. But this really puts our representation, not only this youth representation, no, but our membership, our networks, no, our fellow advocates, our uh, fellow um, organizations no, working in their schools and communities at an imminent risk of discrimination, hostility, or harm. So clearly, red tagging is a violation of the right to due process. A further, there is a no immediate relief and redress for the irreparable damage caused by stigma, discrimination, harassment, and violation of rights. Worse, the same false accusations are being propagated online are being used in trump-up charges, which have been repeatedly dismissed before the Department of Justice and even the Supreme Court of the Philippines. All these uh, false accusations, na basura na, uh, but are now being brought before the Commission on Elections to disqualify or delist our youth sectoral party as an accredited party list in the 2022 polls. Prior to us, another party list in the opposition, Gabriela Women's Party, has been facing a disqualification case uh, since the threats to disqualify opposition party lists were made by security officials under the present administration. Hindi po talaga biro, no? kasi yung nagsimula sa online, nakita na namin laman na ng mga kaso. At kahit pa nabasura na yung mga kaso na yun, ginagamit muli no? para naman sa isang uh, disqualification case sa harap ng COMELEC. Kaya uh, hindi talaga biro no? yung kinakaharap ng uh, mga nagiging target ng red tagging. Targets also include legislators who are also critical and in opposition of various measures being pushed by the Duterte administration. Outspoken critics of President Duterte, particularly his war on drugs, have been deliberately targeted. Senator Laila Dilima has been imprisoned for over four years on falsified drug charges. And uh, uh, we join her and uh, her office and uh, advocates in uh, stepping up our efforts to call for her immediate and unconditional release. We also face a surveillance and uh, increasingly government-backed disinformation campaigns. Uh, katulad nung nakita niyo kanina, hindi lang siya red tagging per se, no? pero yung mga fabricated statements na uh, minamaliit no? yung mga nagiging tagumpay o yung ating mga sinusulong sa loob at labas ng Kongreso. Female lawmakers and even public officials who are critical of the administration also receive misogynistic threats and harassment aimed at both intimidating and discrediting us. I have faced no, um, matinderin yung sexist vilification, hood harassment, and other misogynistic attacks which pose additional challenges to the performances of to the performance of our obligation. And uh, this is totally unacceptable. These attacks on our representation not only violate our fundamental rights, it also undermines our representation as it discredits our work and creates a chilling effect. These threats are done against a member of Congress. What more to an ordinary student, campus journal, an ordinary citizen who are only speaking up and standing up for their rights. So clearly, all these reprisals from red tagging to actual threats have impact on the individual and society as a whole. I would like to reiterate how it creates a chilling effect that makes legislators more reluctant to raise certain topics in the public domain. They also have reputational impacts 
they drain our resources and distract us from our work. Let us also remember that when lawmakers are attacked, it weakens parliament's representativity and by extension, its ability to exercise checks and balances on the executive and uphold fundamental freedoms. Harassment against member of Congress also creates a climate of fear within society, tightening debate and uh, civic space. Opposition lawmakers, by the nature of the work they do, are in the public eye and the reprisals they face send a clear message to the general public that anyone, anyone challenging the government could face similar treatment. Isa po yan sa bagay na ayaw natin na magkapulay pa. It is also important to remember that the harassment we face as representatives are also faced by outspoken youth and students, human rights defenders, journalists, and other pro-democracy and political activists. They are clearly part of a broader attempt to silence all critical voices and remove all forms of accountability. Kaya sa lahat ng mga challenges na yan o sa ating mga kabataan, sa mga estudyante, sa representasyon ito no, na an, nagsusulong, nakasama no, yung mga student councils, governments, ng campus uh, press, ng iba't ibang panukala, katulad ng campus press freedom bill, uh, ng iba't ibang mga hakbang ngayon, bilang tugon sa mga concerns ng mga estudyante sa pandemya. Ang aming panawagan at nakikita na natin na ginagawa, nagpapatuloy, ng mga kabataan at estudyante sa buong bansa. That does not allow red tagging and other attacks to cover us into silence. Let us not allow red tagging to take away our stories of hope, struggle, and victory. Youth and students have also worked with and alongside education stakeholders in combating red tagging and upholding academic freedom from sharing fact-check reports and articles from left from Rappler and various uh, media sites. Lahat ng mga naglalabas ng mga fact-check ng mga articles, dapat natin yung share. Pwede rin natin talakayin sa ating mga organizations, sa iba't ibang mga webinars. And just a quick update on uh, the bills we filed in in Congress. The draft uh, bill no, on uh, institutionalizing the UPDNP Accord as part of the UP Charter has already been approved at the committee level. And this uh, paved the way towards uh, the hastening of uh, uh, the deliberation for other bills and measures to defend academic freedom, but to ensure that uh, institutional autonomy of our higher education institutions as guaranteed by the Constitution will, uh, will be tackled before the Committee on Higher and Technical Education. Inexpect natin yan kung hindi man ngayong buwan at pabalitaan namin kayo agad uh, sa first week no, ng August. Na dahil napasa na yung, yung sa UP, nagbukas talaga to ng panawagan sa marami nating mga eskwelahan. Na bakit sa UP lang? No, dapat sa lahat ng uh, institutions of higher learning natin. Saan ayon sa nakasaad sa, sa Ligang Batas? Uh, we saw no, how youth and students are really at the forefront no, of this cause. What else? Bills are related to, up, to upholding you know, the freedom of teachers and students to teach, study, and pursue knowledge and research without unreasonable interference or restriction in all higher education institutions in the Philippines. There are also various House resolutions calling for a bet, an end to targeted disinformation, red tagging, and HRs to protect educational institutions as zones of peace and academic freedom. No? Excited po ang mga kabataan at estudyante na yan ay matalakay na. Nakita natin kung ano ba yung kasalukuyan na kalagayan, ano yung mga threats no, sa uh, exercise no, ng, ng academic freedom ng ating mga leaders sa ating institutions at anong pwede natin pagtulungan. Ano yung ambag, hindi lang ng sektor ng kabataan at estudyante, pero yung ambag mismo ng komunidad sa pagtutulungan. We have also witnessed no, youth and students at the forefront of uh, 
inspiring youth-led initiatives and campaigns in many fronts of the pandemic and disaster response, rehabilitation and recovery initiatives. Ibig sabihin, ito yung pamamaraan yun ng mga kabataan na anong red tagging? Na ito yung ginagawa namin, ito yung, yung kaya namin gawin, at ito yung hindi namin ititigal na gawin no? dahil kailangan at meron kaming kaya na maiambag aming komunidad. At nakikita natin yan, hindi lang sa ating kasalukuyan na kalagayan, no? kundi sa kasaysayan ng ating bayan. There are a number of notable examples as seen in the various community relief initiatives from community kitchens to community pantries to help combat hunger and poverty exacerbated by the massive loss of jobs and livelihood due to the highly insecure economic situation brought about by the pandemic. Hindi nagtago na kumbaga yung mga kabataan kundi lalo yung pinakita kung ano yung kaya niyang gawin. Mas kisipat rin nun, di ba, ng ng maginhawa community pantry na red tag dahil lang sa isang larawan na siya ay nakataas kamao na nagtulak na sa maraming mga estudyante na mag-post din ng kanilang mga larawan, hindi lang sa community pantry, kundi yung mga nag-cheer para sa kanilang team sa UAAP o kaya naman nagsasalita no, para sa karapatang pantao at iba pang mga causes. These community relief initiatives have also played a key role in calling for expedient government support through direct cash subsidies and other support programs. The young people who are also at the forefront of reminding our public officials, our policymakers to mind the digital and income gap. Internet connectivity, technological advancement have made all of us in the advocacy world more connected and more prolific than ever before. But it also brought with it a number of more pervasive problems, no, such as digital surveillance, breach of privacy, or revisionism online, disinformation. We must take all these into consideration in our continued pursuit of meaningful youth engagement for inclusive and responsive measures. Nothing about us without us. Sobrang halaga no, na may alam, nakikaalam, nananaliksik at uh, Tinutulak din natin ang mga kabataan at estudyante na pag-aralan ng issue no, para makapag-ambag uh, bilang mga uh, sila yung nakakaranas mismo nitong mga palisiyan na to na pinapatupad natin sa loob at labas ng ating mga pamantasan. Gayun din pagdating sa pandemic response at recovery. Kaya no, ang mga estudyante nasa unahan din nitong secure, uh, yung movement for uh, secure quality and relevant education we have launched a national campaign for creating community learning spaces for learners who are struggling with modules and online classes. Students are at the forefront of forwarding their demands before public officials, especially in ensuring that all aspects of education, pandemic response, and recovery plan includes them in the process. Uh, the youth also demands a careful planning and preparation for the prompt and safe reopening of schools based on risk assessment, as well as the prioritization of teachers, faculty, and the staff in COVID-19 vaccination as they are our frontliners in this learning crisis. Nagtagumpay po dyan ang mga kabataan at estudyante from uh, B1, no? ngayon, parte na ng A4, yung ating mga teachers, education support personnel. We have also seen young people push for measures in but economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic to break away from the past and instead shift towards a just, sustainable, and resilient economy. This shows how the youth are really cares not in shifting towards a greener economy that boosts decent employment, offers social protection to all, you know, including all these measures on education relief and student aid. We supported our private schools you know, in their call to stop the tax rate hike no, from 10% uh, uh, na magiging 25%. No, kailangan palakasin pa natin yung support na dyan ng uh, mga estudyante. At gayon din, no, yung necessary bills na kailangan sa loob ng Kongreso ay naipasan na rin sa harap ng, ng Committee on Ways and Means. We also uh, call no, for uh, sustainable food supplies, which will not only help the region to more rapidly absorb the immediate impact of the recession, but also to avoid 
and be more resilient to future similar shocks and crises. So as you can see, the young people um, can really play a significant role in demanding accountability from lawmakers and policymakers and ensuring that all measures aimed at economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic are there you know, to advance a just, sustainable, and resilient economy that promotes and respects the human rights of all. No, kaya, ang laging tanong ng mga kabataan, bakit tayo, bakit parang takot na takot sa atin, no, yung, uh, yung ating mga leader, hindi ba dapat na i-welcome pa, no, yung boses ng mga kabataan, ng mga estudyante, para matiyak, no, na responsive at inclusive yung mga hakbang na ginagawa natin. And so, uh, this youth representation strongly urges you to stand in solidarity with the Filipino youth, students, and the people in defending democracy by joining the call to end red tagging and hold the purveyors of state-sponsored vilification and false information accountable. Let us build a culture of empowerment and respect for human rights. We must ensure the promotion and full realization of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by young people, as the full enjoyment of such rights and freedoms empower the youth, empower us to actively contribute as citizens to nation building and fulfill our role in shaping inclusive development in our society. We must also defend the frontline role of the students and young people in the pursuit of better leadership, good governance, human rights, justice, peace, and climate initiatives. No? as a part of our manifesto for just and green recovery. We must also create spaces for dialogue and discussion on the freedom of thought and expression as we work to protect human rights defenders and mandate the inclusion of age and development appropriate human rights education, peace education, and critical media and information literacy in uh, the Philippine education system. Yan po yung mga tatlong pangonahin na tinutulak namin na dapat ang pinakaligtas na espasyo para pag-usapan ang karapatang pantao, ang usapang pangkapayapaan, ang media and information, pati na rin ang digital literacy ay ang ating mga eskwelahan. So, kaya po, samahan niyo kami sa pagtutulak. Before I end, I wish to say that we must never give, give up standing up for uh, human rights and democracy. We in Kabata and have high hopes that in solidarity we can overcome and we must emerge from this crisis together. Wag po natin kakalimutan na ang ating lakas ay nasa ating pagkakaisa. There is hope. Ang pag-asa ay nasa ating paglaban para sa karapatan, dignidad ng tao at demokrasya ng ating lipunan. Muli, ang ating lakas ay nasa ating pagkakaisa. Our strength is in our unity and solidarity. That would be all for now. Thank you for Thank you, Congresswoman Elago, for that very empowering presentation on the power of the youth and the effects of red tagging on the youth. It is true no, that we must all do our part in ending red tagging due to its malicious effects towards the youth, different sectors, and dissenters. Tama, no? It's not just a stigma or political harassment that we want to avoid but we want to avoid future grave effects such as physical dangers and even death. And I think it was proven already in our current society that red tagging comes as a prelude to death and we must do all we can to stop it. As said by Congresswoman Sara Elago, let us not allow red tagging to cower us into silence. We must all defend our academic freedom, defend our basic rights, and most importantly, continue to defend our democracy. We highly appreciate the Honorable Congresswoman for the time she has spent with us today, and we will continue supporting you po and your representations. To more victories po, Congresswoman Elago. Indeed, Calvin. Oh, totoo nga na ang kabataan, ang pag-asa ng bayan. And Congresswoman Sara Elago just showed us that the youth has something to do with persevering in the face of adversity. That's right, Kath. Pero before we proceed, no, mukhang mabigat-bigat na ang pinag-uusapan natin today. What do you think? Naho, I definitely agree with you on that. And I think it is just the right time for a breather. May we again invite everyone to please pay attention to your screen for a small intermission number before we move on to our next speaker. 
Musicians for Democracy is an organization of singers, composers, and instrumentalists who aims to unite with the masses and the prog progressive Filipinos who are mobilizing themselves to forward their cause in ensuring the freedom of the Filipino people and in creating a government that is lawful and effective. Let us all give a virtual round of applause for our friends for Musicians of for Democracy.
What a wonderful performance from musicians from democracy. Mukhang deserve pa ata nila ng isang virtual round of applause dyan. Ayan. Anyhow, now that we've had time to reflect and absorb the first two presentations, I think we're ready to move on to our next speaker. All right. Our next speaker is the former editor-in-chief of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, a former coordinator of the Alianza ng Kabataang Mamamahayag, and is the current Deputy Secretary General of the College Editors Guild of the Philippines. Let us all welcome Ms. Regina Tolentino. Hello, and magandang hapon po sa lahat. Uh, maraming salamat sa pag invita ng... Lasal siya ka ng Rappler sa CEGP. So, ayan. Yung topic natin today ay yung hinggil sa mga kabataan. So, yung mga kabataan, bigyan lang natin ng background kung ano ba tayo sa lipunan. Uh, critical yung role natin bilang mga kabataan dun sa kasalukuyang sitwasyon. So, paano ba natin nasabi na critical yung role natin? Kung babalikan natin sa kasaysayan, napakaraming mga uh, pagbabago na in spearhead o sinimulan ng mga kabataan. So, makita natin na dahil uh, nasa yugto tayo ng historic confrontation, eh, napapansin nyo ba na sobrang tumitindi na yung uh, political situation at yung magiging decision natin ay siya yung magde-define ng future ng bansa natin saka ng, um, ng bayan natin. So kapag tinalakay natin yung usapin ng mga kabataan, syempre hindi natin pwedeng hiwalay o i-discount yung majority ng political forces na meron sa bansa. No, dahil yung mga kabataan, although maganda siyang ano eh, um, pagsisimula, siya yung nagsisimula palagi, siya yung nakapanguna, hindi na, hindi mawawala yung uh, liit ng porsyento ng populasyon niya. Kaya sa pagkakaroon natin ng um, pagkakaroon natin ng uh, development ng mga political fights natin, uh, necessary na kinakaisa ng mga kabataan yung mga professionals, mga teachers natin, yung mga professors natin, Uh, kasama na din dyan yung uh, sector ng kababaihan, ng mga magsasaka, ng mga manggagawa. So, lahat tayo ay obligated na tumindig. No? Linawin natin yung stand natin dun sa mga issues. Uh, laban dun sa binabanggit natin na historic confrontation na nararanasan natin ngayon. So bakit natin kailangan tumindig dun? Dahil yung epekto nitong confrontation na to, Napaka-influential niya. Binanggit nga kanina nung mga dating, uh, yung mga speaker kanina, no, na sa elections pa lang, di ba, yung effect nung uh, pagkakaroon natin ng tindig, uh, very influential siya dun sa pagde-define nung future ng ating political fight. Ayan. Next slide po. So, tatalakayin natin dito, hindi lang yung hinggil sa paano ba natin pananatilihin yung seguridad natin bilang mga kabataan sa gitna ng matinding fascism na tinatawag natin, kundi tatalakayin din natin objectively bakit ba may red tagging, bakit ba siya nangyayari, ano yung uh, societal basis niya. And yung pangalawa, gusto nating ipakita na sa panahon na may vulnerabilities tayo bilang mga kabataan dahil sa pagsasalita natin, ano yung vulnerabilities na nararanasan ng mga communities sa gitna ng mga attacks na to? At ano yung kayang gawin ng mga kabataan para uh, isanib yung lakas niya doon sa mga sectors na ito? Ayan. Tapos, uh, syempre, lastly, talakayin din natin yung kondisyon na uh, paano natin uh, pabibilisin yung pagsulong natin. So, may plan, may elegant. <laughs> Ayan. Ayan. Uh, Clear naman yung ano yung sound. Adjust ko lang saglit ah. And okay na po ba? Sige. Ayan, next slide po. Ayan, talakayin muna natin yung red tagging. So yung red tagging bilang isang actually isa siyang uh, ideological na offensive. So bakit natin siya tinawag na ideological offensive? Kasi 
una, binivilify niya yung dissent. No? Binivilify niya yung different political spectrum, kahit ano man yan, na um, tumutunggali dun sa ano yung gusto ng uh, current ruling na government. No? So, ang itsura niyan, yung mismong anti-terror law, na bago pa man magkaroon ng anti-terror law, meron na talagang red tagging. So, yung offensive na ginagawa nitong anti-terror law, hindi lang siya atake sa dissent. No? Mamaya tatalakay natin bakit yung mismong red tagging and anti-terror law, sabuatan siya para labagin yung constitution natin mismo, yung sovereignty, and yung territorial integrity natin. Makita, ni- uh, makita nyo dito sa slide na yung mismong batas, no, may mga certain policies and laws tayo na pinapasa, pinapasa ng Philippine government. Pero yung kapalit ng pag approve niya ay mga policies na pinutulak ng United States o kaya naman favor sa mga foreign countries. So para magkaroon tayo ng idea, lalo na sa mga kabataan na ano natin, participants, kung familiar kayo sa K-12 program, ng uh, Aquino regime, yung pagpapatupad ng mismong K-12 program ay yung kapalit niya, ay yung pagpapautang ng halos 10 billion arms bill ng US sa Pilipinas. So, ganun din sa anti-terror law. No? Nung ginawa natin to anti-terror bill, pero law na siya ngayon. No? So, yung pag approve ng uh, anti-terror law, um, kapalit niya yung arms deal ni Duterte. So kung matatandaan nyo, in the middle of pandemic, merong mga pinadala na mga arms yung United States sa bansa natin. At yung may recent news nga lang din halos, di ba, na maraming mga parang worn down na mga equipment yung US na binibenta sa bansa o kahit ginagawang sort of donation. Pero alam natin na between those two, uh, those two countries, meron siyang kapalit. Diba? Meron siyang kapalit. So ano yon oh, Next slide po natin. Ayan. Talakayin natin ano yung objective na kalagayan ng bansa at yung mismong panlipunang batayan ng uh, red tagging o yung atake sa mga kabataan at other sectors. Ayan. Next slide po. So ngayon, yung objective na kalagayan ng bansa natin Uh, unang-una, tinalakay muna natin no, yung parang general na par- landscape ng bansa natin. Sa ngayon, namamang pa sa dalawang ilog yung current uh, Duterte regime. So, uh, yung China nagsiserve as a uh, sort of parang nagpipinan siya dun sa, ano niya, sa, sa regime niya. And yung kapalit nun, syempre yung, ano niya, yung pagkoto niya sa China, di ba, nahayaan yung West Philippine Sea dun sa um, pag exploit nung, ano, ng bansa ng China. And then, syempre, sa US, nananatili pa rin yung mga uh, economic tsaka military na mga kasunduan sa bansa natin. So, EDCA, VFA, tapos kung economic yan, uh, napakaraming mga economic na mga batas na nagbibigay ng... Uh, parang advantage sa United States. Pwedeng makita natin diyan halimbawa yung rice tarification law, 'di ba, na nagbibigay ng luwag dun sa mga produkto ng ibang bansa, no? Na ang effect niya nalulugi yung mga magsasaka natin. So nandiyan din yung uh, US military command, no? Kung nabalitaan niyo yung yung plane crash recently, yung mga US led operation sa bansa natin, yung Uh, iba't ibang mga bombing doon sa mga communities. Tapos syempre nandiyan yung build 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 program na sa actual kung titignan natin uh, dapat magse-serve siya doon sa mga lugar na may pinakakailangan talaga ng uh, infrastructure. Pero kung titignan niyo even yung mga reports ng mga news sites natin, halos lahat 'yan naka sa NPR, 'di ba? So ano yung implication niya kung saan yung investment ng mga foreign uh, investors nandun din y- nagse-serve yung mga infrastructure projects katulad ng build build build. At syempre yung charter change na recently lang ay uh, gustong ipasa, 'di ba? Dahil nagbibigay siya ng 100% na or- uh, foreign ownership dun sa mga nagnenegosyo sa bansa natin. And syempre yung uh, iba't ibang 
parang corrup- corruption schemes ng uh, mga politiko lalong-lalo na napapasok yung election. Even wala pang election eh, wala pang election period, di ba? Ayan, next slide po. Ayan. Mula dun sa ano, sa objective na kalagayan, meron tayong mga um, policies, merong policies na pinapatupad yung government natin na hindi man siya policy pero pwedeng effect ng policy niya. Nandiyan yung corruption, yung killings, yung ambition ng mga nakaupo sa pwesto. Ano pa ba? Nagdadagdag sila ng buwis sa mga Pilipino para bayaran yung mga loans na halos lagpas nata ng 10 trillion, di ba? Na supposedly gagamitin para sa vaccine pero halos even yung mga bayanihan ng mga batas hindi naman na ipapamahagi. Tapos Ah, uh, kumbaga parang nawawala na lang din yung ano, yung effect niya. So hindi na naipapamahagi sa mga Pilipino. Nandiyan din yung pagtaas ng presyo ng bilihin, kawalan ng hanap buhay, mababang pasahod. So kung titingnan natin, napakaraming mga economic basis, no? O mga economic policies na ginagawa yung government natin na talagang ang epekto sa mga mamamayan ay lalong pagkalugmok. No, nandiyan din yung kawalan ng fund sa kalusugan, nandiyan yung mabagal na pag-respond sa pandemic, uh, kawalan ng bakuna para sa lahat. So, ilang porsyento pa lang sa ngayon yung nababakunahan. And syempre, sobrang lala nung kalagayan ng edukasyon natin, di ba, sa online distance learning, hindi pa rin makapag uh, tulak ng ligtas na balik eskwela hanggang sa ngayon. And syempre, yung walang katapusan na pag-utang pa rin ng government. Ayan, next slide po. So dahil nakita natin bilang mga Pilipino, bilang mga kabataan, na itong mga batas na to wala namang necessary para sa amin eh. Hindi naman kami nakikinabang dito. Kahit na yung buwis namin, yung nagpapatakbo dapat ng government at naibabalik sa amin. So para panatilihin yung mga economic interest na ilan lang yung nakikinabang, ang epekto niya ay yung mga ideological offensive and even yung harassment o tinatawag nating na fascism. So siya yung pagpupwersa na pasunurin natin yung mamamayan. No, kung mapapansin niyo, 'di ba, sa mga ginagawa ni Duterte, halos sa mga policies na gusto niya, walang scientific basis. Halos hearsay na lang yung pinagsasabi niya, wala na siyang credibility no para sundin ng mga mamamayan. So dahil do, nagre-resort siya doon sa pananakot, sa fear harassment para mapasunod niya pa rin yung mga Pilipino. Ano pang mga pamamaraan dyan? Siyempre yung militarization. Hindi man natin nakikita yung mismong itsura ng militarization sa mga uh, sentrong lungsod or sa mga cities. Pero ever since, no, nakakaranas yung iba't ibang mga probinsya ng mga straffing, pambobomba, at iba pang mga uri ng uh, pangangamkam ng lupa no, through dun sa heavy or intense militarization sa mga Uh, mga probinsya. So, nandyan din yung NTF-LCAC. Sa actual, yung NTF-LCAC, more than dun sa pagiging mouthpiece nila ng mga kasinungalingan, yung whole of nation approach ni, ni Duterte, siya yung magko-coordinate sa halos lahat ng agencies ng government para uh, stifle yung dissent. Ibig sabihin, systematic niyang ginagawa yung ganitong uh, uri ng red tagging, yung iba't ibang mga uh, pananakot even sa mga barangay levels, di ba? Limbawa yung mga ano natin, yung mga gusto mag-volunteer lang, di ba, ng uh, magbigay ng mga economic uh, relief sa mga kababayan eh nareread tag pa, di ba? So nandiyan din yung Oplan Tokhang and syempre definitely yung anti-terror law na uh, nagli-legalize na mismo nung pinaggagawa nila ngayon sa sa whole of nation approach sa NTFL cap. So nandiyan din no yung mga illegal arrest, yung mga raids dun sa mga leaders no, sa mga youth leaders natin, sa mga labor leaders, sa mga peasant leaders at iba pang mga uh, leader natin no na nagsusulong ng alternative politics no kahit sa mga simpleng uh, halimbawa sa mga konseho, 'di ba, sa mga publikasyon, nakakaranas tayo ng iba't ibang uri ng harassment. Diba? Even sa mga mamamayan mismo, di ba nga nung start ng pandemic, even yung mga nagsasalita lang sa Facebook regarding sa ayuda ay uh, parang binigyan din ng mga subpina, di ba, pinaghahanap sa mga kabahayan. So ayun yung 
mga pamamaraan para panatilihin yung economic interest ng iilan. Ayan, next slide po. So, yung makita natin, mula dun sa economic interest ng iilan, hindi mawawala ng sa kasaysayan natin. Kasaysayan siya ng pakikipagtunggali ng mga democratic forces laban dun sa ginagawa ng uh, government natin para agawin yung, uh, yung democratic rights natin. So, kung may mga kamalian sa pulisiya, yung government, napakaraming mga uh, groups, mga youth groups, mga council, mga publications, na nagsusulong ng alternative, di ba? Halimbawa na diyan yung student aid bill na uh, sinusulong natin kasama rin nung syempre ng uh, Kabataan Party List saka ng iba pang mga grupo. Uh, pangalawa naman, uh, yung tunggalian ng fascism ay nilalabanan natin ng malinaw na program, di ba? Yung mga health workers natin nag uh, nag-o-offer sila o nagbibigay sila ng mga alternative na ganito yung kailangan namin, di ba? kailangan namin ng dagdag at least na mga um, at least yung magagamit nila sa everyday yung mga sa dahil sa mga risk na nararanasan nila yung mass testing di ba isa rin yan sa mga una nating kinampanya at yung pagbibigay ng libre at ligtas na bakuna so makita natin na yung government wala siyang ginawa kundi magpukol ng magpukol ng counter insurgency program iba't ibang mga oplan yan oplan bayanihan oplan makabayan Ngayon yung ano yung yung oplan ni Duterte, oplan Kapanatagan, oplan Pacific Eagle. So instead na harapin niya yung roots kung bakit ba may mga nag-aarmas, no? Harapin yung uh, usapang pangkapayapaan, ibigay yung lupa sa mga magsasaka at magtaguyod ng isang pambansang industriya ng libreng edukasyon para sa lahat. Hindi yun yung nireresolba, 'di ba? Nandiyan din yung dictatorship laban dun sa dissent and akad freedom. And syempre, yung tinatalakay natin ngayon na yung mismong anti-terror council, isa na siya sa pinaka-manifestation ng paglabag sa saligang batas. Kasi parang nilalagay mo na yung mismong batas dun sa kamay ng konseho na to para mag-decide kung sino ba yung target nila na mga so-called terrorists. Ayan, next slide po. So mula dun sa mga pinakita natin ng na mga tunggalian ng mga interest at kalagayan nung nung ekonomiya natin no yung ekonomiyang bat pang ekonomiyang batayan pang lipunang batayan kung bakit may red tagging bakit may fascism and militarization may kita natin yung vulnerability ng mga sectors natin lalong lalo na yung community ayan next slide po Ayan, gustong talakayin nung topic na to kung paano mapapanatili natin yung seguridad, yung safety ng ating mga educators, yung security natin bilang mga kabataan na lumalaban. Pero ang pinaka-key point dito, mapapanatili ng kabataan yung strength niya, yung strength ng kanyang movement kung sumasanib yung mismong movement niya sa hanay ng mga marginalized and mga Uh, sectors. Sa totoo nga, hindi vulnerable yung term natin eh, dahil yung mismong mga sectors, lumalaban sila. ba? Diba? Hindi sila um, hindi sila yung mga pinaglalaban natin, kundi sumasama tayo at kumahanay tayo sa laban nila. Pero ang isang key point dito, yung mga kabataan sa kasaysayan, laging siya yung haligi at nagmamarcha sa unahan. No, lagit-lagi na yung mga pinangungunahang kampanya ng mga kabataan ay sinusundan ng mga sektor na kung nasaan yung majority ng population natin. So, ano yung kailangan natin gawin bilang mga kabataan? Kailangan magsagawa tayo ng, etong uh, ginagawa natin, di ba, forma siya ng edukasyon. Pero higit pa dun sa ginagawa natin online, uh, dalhin natin to sa pamilya natin, paliwanag natin sa kanila, um, Ipaliwanag natin sa kanila ano ba yung nagaganap ngayon na cult, uh, culture of impunity, yung mga fake news na nakita nila sa Facebook. ba diba? Isanib natin yung practice natin sa mga sectors and mga community. Ayan, next slide po. Dapat manguna tayo dun sa pagbitbit ng mga issue and malalim na pakikiisa dun sa hanay ng mga manggagawa sa mga magsasaka. Diba? So totoo lang sa... sa organization din ng CEGP, isang pinaplano din magkaroon ng mga uh, pag-aaral or mga webinars na ang invite din talaga natin ay yung mga sectors para maipahayag din nila 
sa mga kabataan, ano yung nararanasan ng mga atake ng sectors, ng mga uh, probinsya, ba? Diba? Tapos, uh, pag alam sa sitwasyon, tsaka pagsasagawa ng pagsisiyasat. So, dito sa parte na to, particular siguro sa mga campus journalists no, na nandito, yung pag alam natin sa sitwasyon ng mga communities ko na saan tayo, necessary talaga, no? Limbawa yung ginagawa ng uh, MOVE PH, na talagang uh, pumupunta sila sa prima, uh, primary source ng information para makagawa ng mga balita, ng mga uh, analysis dun sa nararanasan ng subject natin. And syempre, yung offensive natin sa pagpapaliwanag. Diba? Wag tayo agad madishearten kung hindi agad, um, di natin agad nakakaisa yung mga kinakausap natin o kaya naman uh, tinotrol tayo sa ano sa online, di ba? Siyempre, minsan talaga yung patients natin <laughs> na ano rin, na-challenge din siya. Pero kailangan mag- maging offensive yung pagpapaliwanag natin. Hindi lang siya maging pasibo. Kung nag-share tayo ng mga post, uh, basahin natin siya para eventually sa mga mga kausap natin, may bahagi din natin. And syempre, yung offensive natin sa pagpapalawak, ibig sabihin nito, mas lalo pa nating uh, palawakin yung mga kaisahan natin. Diba? Kaisahin natin yung iba't iba pang mga konseho, kaisahin pa natin yung mga campus journalist, ba? Diba? Yung tambalan kasi ng mga council natin tsaka mga campus journalist, isang key rin yan eh. ba diba? Sa pagtataguyod natin ng mga campaigns na gusto nating uh, i-forward, ba? Diba? Sama rin ng iba pang mga youth organizations and other sectors. Ayan, next slide po. Ayan, ito yung sagot natin doon sa tanong na Paano natin pananatilihin yung uh, tuloy-tuloy na paglaban natin at seguridad sa gitna ng mga atake? Yung malalim tsaka organisado at nagkakaisang lakas natin, yung tunay na sasalag dun sa mga attacks. Yung mismong mga nakakasama natin sa hanay ng mga campaigns and advocacy natin, sila rin yung makakasama natin para... Um, Kumbaga, sagutin yung mga atake sa atin. Kaya nga, di ba, necessary na kung di pa tayo organized ng any youth organization, wala pa tayong kinabibilangan ng mga council, ng mga campus publication, and other organization. Siguro, isang um, push na rin sa atin na magpa-organisa tayo. Magpa-organisa tayo sa mga organisasyon. O kung saan man yung advocacy natin o gusto natin talagang suportahan. And makiisa tayo sa iba pang mga organisasyon. Ayun, next slide po. Ayun, yung pag paglalatag ng kondisyon para mas mapabilis yung mga kampanya natin, no? Pag mapabilis yung pagsulong niya. Ayun, next slide po. Ayun, so sa paglakas ng laban natin, tsaka yung pagsabay natin dun sa tinatawag natin na pihit ng politika. Sinabi nating pihit ng politika, mabilis siyang magbago eh, 'di ba? Pero necessary na pangunahan natin yung mga kampanya tsaka advocacy and mulat tayong manindigan. No? Kung mga kabataan tayo, uh, ilagay natin yung sarili natin sa unahan lagi ng struggle. Yung bilang mga forefront ng struggle. Kasi wala namang ibang manguna kundi tayo eh. ba diba? Kung wala tayong organization, magpa-organize tayo. Kung sa organization natin, meron pang sort of Uh, pagiging apolitikal dun sa nangyayaring sitwasyon ngayon, tayo yung manguna para i-educate sila. Pwede tayong mag ng iba pang mga pwedeng uh, magbigay ng mga uh, situationers, ano na yung nangyayari ngayon sa politics ng bansa natin. Tapos, uh, manatili yung pinakamahigpit at hindi mapuputol na koneksyon sa mga manggagawa at mga magsasaka. So, na pinaka-majority ng populasyon natin at kapag sinabi nating atake, Ilan sa mga pinaka uh, susceptible dun sa mga atake na meron? Di ba nga sa anti-terror law, ang una talaga naging um, inatake niyan, yung mga katutubo, eh, di ba, mga magsasaka. So, kailangan uh, mas lalo natin ibigkis yung strength natin sa kanila. Ayan. Next slide po. Ayan. So, ito rin yung binabanggit natin na alam ko maraming mga efforts din sa Lasal, no? Yung mga uh, mga Lasalian, 'di ba, na nag-organize din sa mga communities, nagbibigay ng mga pag-aaral sa mga kabataan, tinuturuan sila ng mga modules nila. So, kung di pa man tayo makalabas para 
para suportahan, pwede tayong magbigay ng iba't ibang mga forms ng suporta natin. Uh, pataasin yung kamulatan, saka praktika ng mga kapwa natin kabataan. And syempre, mas lalo nating palawakin yung sphere of influence natin. ba? Diba? Para kung ano man yung mga ataking maranasan natin. Meron tayong united na alliance, for example. Meron tayong nagkakaisang alyansa na meron tayong uh, kaisahan dun sa... Uh, sa salukuyang sitwasyon, halimbawa, anti-terror law, di ba? Kung sa, sa Lasal ba yun, may mga anti-terror law ba ng mga alliance na talagang tuloy-tuloy na nagkakampanya laban sa uh, batas na to, ayun. Ayun yung ilan sa mga pwede nating gawin. So, Siyempre, nandiyan yung ano natin, di ba? Yung, yung student government, student council na napakalaki ng influence para mas mag-educate pa ng buong studentry. Hindi lang... Hindi lang sa ano no sa parang main kundi dun sa system wide na mga ano natin system wide na mga schools ba diba? kasi yung CGP nakapag tala din siya ng iba pang mga publications diba sa iba't ibang mga parang hindi ko sure kung branch yung tawag niya doon sa ano sa mga school sa Albao sa Dasma ayan okay. next slide po And to na yung binabanggit natin kanina no yung pagiging makasaysayan ng confrontation and reiteration siya na kung lalaban tayo ngayon na natin siya gawin di ba and kailangan kapag lumaban tayo kumahanay tayo hindi tayo mag-isang lumalaban at yung stand natin ay malinaw kailangan malinaw yung stand natin dahil nga sobrang influential yung takbo, yung ginagawa ng mga kabataan ngayon sa susunod pang panahon. So, halimbawa na lang yan, yung elections, di ba? Ayan, next slide po. Ayan. So, dahil mga student leaders yung gusto nating uh, mas i-address talaga sa talk na to, yung sinabi ni Leon Alejandro na isa rin talagang kilalang leader kabataan na sumuong sa iba't ibang Uh, uri ng ano no ng ng struggle no even sa tumakbo rin siya um, sa parliament de ba tapos uh, kasama rin siyang nag-organize sa mga schools no ang sabi niya diyan in the line of fire is the place of honor ayan so next slide po yung pinakalas na ata to ayan sa kasalukuyan po uh, sa journalist and mga councils natin nag natulong ngayon ng Uh, kampanya yung CGP para suportahan natin sa man ng iba pang organization yung 10K student aid at financial aid para sa lahat ng uh, mga mamamayan tapos pangalawa ay makapag-assert ng pro student mode of learning lalo na sa mga uh, ano natin mga campus journalist natin at sa mga student leaders din natin 'di ba na kumakaharap ng iba't ibang mga kahirapan sa um, mga kahirapan sa distance learning Pangatlo ay pagpapanawagan natin na ma-release yung mga publication fund ng mga publication. Kasi isang, sa isang banda, although hindi nakakapag-print ngayon yung publication, kailangan-kailangan ng mga pubs natin yung uh, operational expenses, even online sila nagpa-publish. And then, um, syempre, panawagan natin na magkaroon ng safe resumption ng classes, makabalik sa operasyon yung mga pubs natin, At least mabukas yung mga offices ulit nila para makapag-press work. 'Di ba? Kasi ngayon sobrang hirap talaga mag-press work dahil online eh, 'di ba? Nakaka-apekto rin siya doon halimbawa sa mental health ng mga uh, mga campus journal natin. Tapos uh, syempre, yung paglaban natin sa iba't ibang forma ng repression at yung pakikipaglaban para sa press freedom. So ayun po yung Uh, yung message natin para sa lahat ng participants. Eh, maraming salamat po. Thank you for that very comprehensive presentation on red tag in universities, Regina. No? Definitely, I think there is a need no, the, to protect students in universities from the dangers of red tagging. This is a reminder as well to all our viewers that we shouldn't be afraid to express our views and dissent against government policies. Bilang hamon sa atin, pinaalala ni Regina na ang kabataan ay laging nasa unahan ng matcha. So we need to take a stand because it influences the future of our political fight. The right to freely organize and our right to expression is a duly demandable right provided in our constitution itself. Tama ka dyan, Calvin. 
not to mention we shouldn't be threatened with persecution in general if we know that we are doing nothing wrong. To criticize the government and its policies is a right no one should and can take away from us. Anyhow, to keep the event going, we are now at the last but not the least presentation for today. Our next speaker is a volunteer teacher at Alternative Learning Center for Agricultural and Livelihood Development, otherwise known as Alcadev Lumad School from 2016, and the current sp spokesperson of the Save Our Schools Network. To present us the current Lumad situation and the attacks their community faces, we welcome Mr. Chad Bo. Hello. Uh, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Uh, salamat, uh, Cass and Calvin, uh, sa pag-introduce. Uh, una sa lahat, uh, maraming salamat po sa pagbibigay sa bosses no, ng mga kabataang lumad, sa mga lumad schools no, na magkaroon ng espasyo dito sa uh, webinar na ito ngayong hapon no, sa ating Defend Democracy. Na <clears throat> so ngayong hapon, tatalakayin natin no, yung epekto ng uh, terror law sa komunidad at mga paaralan ng lumad. No? Kung kanina ay nabanggit natin no, yung mga iba't iba't, iba't ibang uh, uh, legal aspects ng terror law, kung paano siya nakaka-apekto no, dito sa mga kabataan sa kasyudaran. Ngayon naman, uh, gusto kong bigyang larawan naman no, kung paano nga ba nangyayari at paano na i-implement ang terror law no, sa kanayunan. No? Since ito yung madalas natin na na hindi nabibigyan masyado ng uh, atensyon sa media or sa <coughs> kahit sa social media. So, eh, next slide po. So, yung ano, yung presentation ko ay mas mag-focus na sa Andab Valley Complex. No? Yung Andab Valley, isa siyang uh, ancestral domain ng mga Lumad Manobo no? sa Surigao del Sur. No? Uh, kabilang na dito yung Lianga no yung kung familiar kayo sa recent case ng Lianga massacre uh, part siya ng Andap Valley complex no? so napakayaman niya sa natural resources no uh, yung mga puno yung mga uh, mga rivers mga caves no at syempre sa ilalim din ng lupaing ito andiyan yung uh, mga mineral resources natin tulad ng coal copper gold at saka silver so yung mga lumad naman sa Andap Valley Complex ay meron na rin siyang mahabang kasaysayan no, ng resistance no, laban sa mga uh, mining companies, laban sa mga logging companies na pumapasok sa kanilang lupain at syempre laban na rin sa militarization no, na nagsimula pa noong panahon ni Marcos and even before pa. So ayun, mer meron na silang naitayo ng mga lumad organization yung mapasu, uh, malaho tayong pakigbisog alang sa sumutunod at saka nakapagbuo na rin sila no, ng mga Lumad Schools. Andiyan yung Tribal Filipino Program of Trigal del Sur, yung sa elementary, at saka yung Alcadev Lumad School, kung saan ako nagtuturo, no, or yung Alcadev. <clears throat> so, next slide. So, gusto ko lang ikon, i-share itong map no, ng Andap Valley Complex. So, ito yung malaking kuan, uh, malaking ancestral domain nila. And, Kung makikita niyo, marami siyang mga yung mga text na nakasulat. Yung mga text, yan yung mga uh, lumad schools and communities. No? So, nakalat-kalat siya sa buong, sa buong ancestral domain. And talagang ano siya, puro siya kabubatan, puro siya, uh, talagang nasa sa gitna siya ng kuan, kabundukan. And kung makikita niyo rin po, maraming yung mga nakabox na ano, Yan yung mga iba't ibang mga coal applications, oh, mining applications. No? Andiyan yung sa coal mining under sa Department of Energy at yung mga red na boxes. Yan naman yung mga sa <clears throat> yung mga min metallic na mines no? tulad ng copper, gold, silver. Under naman siya sa Mines and Geosciences Bureau. So talagang napakaraming mga mining companies no? ang nag-a-apply sa lugar ng mga lumad no. Kaya naman talagang uh, pinag-aagawan siya at talagang lumalaban yung mga tao sa area na 'yan. At saka kaya rin uh, pilit na pinapatahimik sila no at pinapatay ng mga 
uh, ng estado, ng, gob- ng gobyerno. So, next. So, ayun. Uh, matagal naman ng koan, maraming mga attacks no, sa sa mga lumad communities. Pero gusto ko lang din, eh, no, bigyang diin kung paano siya mas naging malala no, sa ilalim ng terror law. So, unang-una dyan yung red tagging as in sobrang naging normal na no sa kanayunan kung paano uh, ulit-ulit no na binabanggit ng ng kasundaluhan no yung mga kung paano yung mga pangalan namin bilang mga teachers, yung mga org leaders, no yung mga lumad, mga rights defenders, paulit-ulit na sinasabi sa mga meetings no ng LGU kung paano pinaulit-ulit sa radyo, sa TV kahit saan tapos yung muka namin na no, binabalandran nila sa mga tarpaulin na may nakasulot na kami ay mga terorista no nakalagay sa mga terminal ng bus no at meron din sila mga pinapakalat na mga poster na no, kung nagsasabi na kami ay mga terorista kasulat sa mga uh, bad paper at pinapakalat din nila kung saan-saan tapos ayun uh, tulad ng binanggit din ng na unang mga speakers no yung nasabi nila na yung mga police at sundalo ay talagang nag gumagawa sila ng mga forum din, mga webinar no, sa iba't ibang mga schools no para i-red tag kami para i-discredit no yung uh, legitimate struggle ng mga lumad para sa kanilang lupang minuno. <clears throat> yeah. tapos uh, pangalawa yung intensified uh, militarization no, ng mga lumad schools and communities. So yun nga, uh, tulad ng nasabi ko kanina, matagal na na yung merong militarization sa mga komunidad. Pero ano ba ang pinagkaiba no, ng militarization ngayon? Kasi kung dati, uh, halimbawa yung sa Andap Valley Complex, yung map kanina, nasa around siguro mga 10 to 15 communities yung nandun. No? And kung dati, uh, kung merong militarization, sa isang community na sila nag-stay. No? Isang community at a time. Pero ngayon, sa ehalim ng terror, no, halos sabay-sabay. No? Parang 10 out of 15 na communities, merong mga sundalo na nalang naka, nakapondo doon at nagtayo sila ng mga military detachment. And sobrang <clears throat> sobrang lala ng ginagawa nila as in, uh, simula pa noong kahit actually 2019 no? and dumami sila noong 2020, noong panahon ng pandemya talagang uh, tinik advantage din ng kasundaluhan no, ng estado yung pagkakaroon ng mga lockdown kaya uh, sobrang hirap din no ng mga lumad communities na makapagmaneuver kasi kung dati na kung may merong militarization sa kanilang komunidad na kapag evacuate sila ngayon hindi na sila makapag evacuate kasi nga merong mga lockdown and yun uh, ginagawa ng mga sundalo na doon sa komunidad talagang nag-house to house sila no very sobrang traumatic nga no for them kasi nga uh, maraming mga killings ang nangyari recently no, sa kanila komunidad at meron pang uh, ginagawang mga indiscriminate firing no kung saan halimbawa yung mga sundalo uh, basta-basta lang sila magpapakotok ng kanilang baril no? sa mga bahay, ganyan. So, very traumatic talaga siya para sa uh, ating mga kasamang mga lumad. Tapos, ano pa, yung pagka-house to house, na tapos yung pangal- pangatlo, yung forced surrender. No? Uh, kasi, yung nga, uh, red tagging, tapos, uh, merong parang marching order yung LGU at saka yung mga uh, syempre yung makasabwat ng AFP no. Ah, uh, nagpapadala sila ng mga sulat no sa mga known na mga leaders ng organization ng mga lumal organizations na either mag-surrender kayo bilang mga terorista or bilang mga rebelde or ikukulong namin kayo. So, parang dalawa yung pagpipilian ng mga leaders. Po. So, sobrang nakakatakot talaga nung ganun no kasi nga Nasa komunidad na mismo yung mga sundalo, yung mga police. So kahit sa safety, kahit di ba sinasabi natin na yung mga yung bahay natin, siya dapat yung ating safe space. 
pero para sa mga luma, wala nang safe space, safe space no? kasi inagaw na ng mga kasundaluhan yung safe space nila no. Talagang sabi nga ng isang lumad na nakausap ko no. Ah, uh, sobrang nakaka-anxious no? yung mamuhay na merong mga sundalo sa palibot mo kasi di mo alam kung ano ang mangyayari mamayang gabi, di mo alam ang mangyayari bukas sa umaga. So, kasi nga ang dami ng uh, kasaysayan no? ng mga lumad na talagang napakarahas nila sa tuwing nagkakampo sila sa mga lumad communities. And ito na nga ano, yung so, kapag hindi ka mag-surrender no? bilang uh, rebelde, ganyan. So andyan naman yung mga trump up charges no? and illegal arrest. So marami sa mga lumad leaders talaga ngayon ang um, kinakasuhan ng mga gawa-gawang kaso no. Uh, napakarami na parang ang laging ginagawa ng sundalo no. Kapag merong mga NPA attacks ay sinasama ng ng mga kasundaluhan yung pangalan ng mga legitimate no na lumad leaders doon sa listahan ng mga NPA at uh, sinasama hinahanay sila no. Parang isa sila doon. Tapos, in, illegal arrest and detention. So, yun nga, dahil meron mga cases na bigla-bigla na lang nalulusog sa komunidad na tapos nadamputin yung kahit sino, yung mga leaders or mga random na tao na gusto na lang kunin, ganyan. Sa so, palagang nakakatakot siya. Tapos, yun din, yung isa sa mga recent cases. Next slide. Taglit. Yun. yung si Renalin Tejero no yung uh, isa sa lumad activist no? na nagtatrabaho din as human rights worker no hinuli din siya no nitong March March ba no March 2021 so na, na, talagang ano tinatarga talaga nila no yung mga tao na nag-expose ng the document ng mga human rights uh, violations and eto lang kakapasok lang din ng balita habang nagsisimula yung webinar na to uh, hinuli naman no yung hinuli yung luma leader namin sa Karaga region no si Tina Gomez no? siya ay uh, ano nga siya council member siya no ng uh, kahugpungan sa lumad ng organisasyon ng Karaga no? so yung Lumad Confederation ng mga organization sa Karaga. No, pinuli siya parang two hours ago lang ata. So, ganun kalala ano na habang nagsasalita tayo tungkol sa terror. No? Meron na namang uh, hinuhuli yung mga kasundaluhan at syempre pinaratangan na naman siya bilang uh, isang membro or high ranking na leader ng CPP NPA. So, ganun kalala ang ano ng struggle na para sa mga lumad balik ulit previous slide <coughs> previous slide previous slide ayun so ayun tapos yung yung aerial bombardments no sobrang uh, yun din isa sa pinaka nakakatakot no kasi Uh, usually ang nangyayari diyan uh, sa gabi nag nagbobomba yung mga kasundaluhan no sa yutang kabili no sa sa cell domain ng mga katutubo tapos talagang nakakayanig siya ng lupa no may time nga nung nandun pa ako sa ano community nagpalipad ng mga drone no yung mga kasundaluhan and sobrang traumatizing talaga noong Uh, ganun na experience kasi given din na may sinabi si Duterte na noong 2017 no, na babambahin niya yung mga lumad schools, talagang tumatak siya no, sa uh, alimpatakan ng mga tao and hindi na siya nawala sa amin. And yun nga dahil din sa experience no, na sobrang lala ng mga bombings na nangyayari. As in, parang 2am, maglilipad-lipad yan sila tapos maghuhulog no. at napa, napakalakas talaga ng pagyanig at pag-echo ng ano so and sobrang traumatizing to the point na at even after ilang months na nakalipas no kahit makarinig lang ng mga 
bubuyog or mga lamok, yung mga lumad, ay talagang nagpapanic attack na sila dahil nga uh, sa trauma na na experience nila. Next. So, yun. Tapos, ada, balik. Yung massacre. Yun, yung massacre din, uh, kung nabalitaan natin yung Lianga Massacre 2 kung saan pinatay yung tatlong tatlong lumad farmers no, na si Angel Rivas, si Lani Rivas at si Willie Rodriguez sa kanilang takahan. Uh, dahil nga merong uh, mga sundalo na nagkakampo sa kanilang mga komunidad. No, as in, sobrang <clears throat> uh, saturated no, na no, mga sundalo yung kanilang community na kahit saan sila magpunta talagang parang kontrolado kasi in fact no, uh, para makapunta yung mga lumad sa kanila mga farms kailangan pa nalang magpaalam no? so ganun kahigpit yung mga sundalo meron pa sila mga curfew ganyan so parang wala na sa sariling freedom yung lumad sa kanilang sariling komunidad no? so nagpaalam pa yun sila Angel Rivas si Lenny Rivas para pumunta sa kanilang sakahan at nung pagbalik nga nila after sa ilang days ng kuan Uh, pag-harvest doon sa kanilang farm, pabalik na sana sila ay sila naman yung pinagbabaril no, ng mga uh, kasundaluhan at yun nga, pagbalik ng katawan ng bangkay no, sa kanilang mga pamilya talagang wasak na yung mga muka nila yung mga baraso no, kahit yung kanilang masasilang bahagi ng katawan ay wasak-wasak na kasi ganoon kababoy yung mga kasundaluhan no, sa mga kababaihan sa mga lumad na Talagang wala sa mga respeto kahit uh, patay na yung mga tao. Tapos after po no, no ay talagang pilit na pinapamuka, pinapamuka ng estado ng NTFL ka, no, ng Lorraine Badoy, na mga NPA daw yung mga, yung mga farmers na yun. No. Kahit kahit meron pa silang pictures na no, sila Angel, sila Lenny, sila Willie na masaya pa silang nagpa-farm no, days before bago sila pinas lang. Kaya talagang napaka-desperado ng no, no, estado na ipagmuka talaga na mga rebelde daw sila kahit mga magsataka sila. Tapos, ayun, uh, after pa nung ano, dahil nga, mas, uh, dahil nga na umingay din yung issue no, ng Liangga Massacre 2 ay after noon talagang pilit din na pinapatahimik no, ng kasundaluhan yung pamilya nila uh, inoferan pa ng mga pera ganyan tapos pinagbantaan din no. talagang kinuha yung pamilya ng mga biktima para wag na magsalita at kunwari meron ng mga peace pact na ginawa no. parang marami silang mga ginawang uh, kalokohan para lang hindi na magsalita yung pamilya laban sa kanila. Tapos ayun yung isa din sa ano mga kadalasan na hindi na nila masyadong nababalit na babalita. Yung pagkakaroon ng mga forced evacuations so, dahil nga maraming mga attack sa communities ay napipilitan yung mga lumad no, na umalis na lang sa kanilang komunidad tulad din na itong nasa gitna na picture. No? Kasi di na sila comfortable sa kanilang sariling komunidad dahil sa presensya ng mga kasundaluhan. Tapos, yun, mahirap pa ngayon no? dahil nga may pandemya tapos merong mga food crisis. Talagang hirap sa pagkain no? yung mga lumad. And dagdag pa rin no? yung kuan nga, yung insecurity nila sa pagkain dahil andyan din yung mga kasundaluhan sa kanilang lupang minuno na uh, natatakot na sila ngayon magpunta sa kanilang mga farms no? kasi maraming cases talaga kung saan uh, pinapatay no? o kung di man pinapatay hinaharas sexual harassment no? verbal harassment pananakot yung naranasan ng mga lumad sa tuwing pumapunta sila sa kanilang mga farms yun so ganito yung nangyayari no? sa Lianga sa Andak Valley Complex no? kung saan maraming mga mining companies ang nag-a-apply. Tapos, 
uh, kung titingnan naman siya na sa iba't ibang rehiyon sa Mindanao next. <clears throat> Ganun din no, yung uh, sinasapit no ng mga lumad ng mga lumad leaders and organizations, mga lumad schools no sa ilalim ng terror law. So for example, atong nasa left na picture yung pagsira ng paaralan sa Bukid noon noong 2020 tapos sa right naman ngayon 2021. So talagang uh, the systematic, sabi nga nung naunang speaker, yung NTFL, talagang systematic yung uh, pagsira ng uh, gobyerno no, sa mga forms of resistance na ginagawa ng LUMAD. And dahil nga yung LUMAD schools, isa siya sa mga naging forefront ng paikibakan no, para sa lupang ninuno. Ito, ito talaga yung tinatarget ng mga Uh, state forces natin. Tapos, yun din yung pag red tag and pag vilify no, sa mga lumad leaders sa different regions no, sa Mindanao. Mangyayari din siya no, sa northern Mindanao, sa southern Mindanao. Okay. So, very systematic nga no, yung pagpukuan nila, pag sa target nila. So, yung tanong kanina sa chat box ay kung bakit spinishes specific nagka-target yung koan yung sundalo sa mga lumad kasi nga uh, maraming mga mining applications mga logging applications to na gustong pumasok sa mga lupang ninuno ng mga lumad and dahil nagre-resist yung mga lumad no sa uh grito mga projects to na na nagbe-benefit lang yung mga mayayaman kaya sinatarget talaga sila ng uh, state forces. Next slide. So, yun nga. Dahil nga maraming stress no, sa life ng mga lumad, marami sa mga lumad ngayon ang nagsisik ng sanctuary no, sa kung saan saan. No, sa mga paaralan, sa mga simbahan. No. So, tulad na isa dito ang yung backwood school no, na tinatawag. No, dahil nga yung mga lumad ay uh, militarized na yung kanilang mga communities so yung iba na pipilitan na pumunta sa mga city centers tulad sa Davao City, sa Cebu City and sa Manila no, para uh, makapagpatuloy sa pag-aaral at makapagpatuloy uh, din sa pagpapanawagan na palayasin yung mga sundalo sa kanilang komunidad may pagpatuloy yung uh, pahikipaglaban para sa lupang ninuno pero ano ang ginagawa ng estado next slide so ayun ito yung nangyari sa amin noong February 15 na kahit nagpunta na kami sa isang sanctuary no, para mangipagpatuloy ang pag-aaral namin pagtuturo sa mga kabataan talagang pinuntahan kami no ng mga uh, state forces para pulihin patahimikin no so yun three months kami na nilagay sa kulungan at talagang yung trato sa amin ng mga kulisan ay parang talaga kami mga rebelde, mga terorista. Yung pag-label nila sa amin dun sa loob ng kulungan. No? Yung pag yung way ng pagkulin nila sa amin no? sa nung mismong arrest. Talagang ano. Tapos, yun nga, yung isa dun sa trend na ginagawa ng mga kasundaluhan at kapulisan ngayon ng NTFL CAC, yung pag pipilit nila no, sa mga parents ng mga lumad students no, na magsalita laban sa mga uh, lumad schools, laban sa mga amin ng mga lumad teachers no, kung saan uh, sinatreten nila na yung mga parents na kung hindi sila magsasalita laban sa amin ay ikukulong o kakasuhan ng mga kapulisan yung mga parents. Kaya marami ngayon sa mga parents kahit yung mga estudyante din ang nag-testify laban sa mga lumad schools no, dahil nga sa uh, pang-terrorize no, na ginagawa ng mga kasundaluhan at mga kapulisan uh, laban sa mga lumad, schools, students, at saka sa mga parents. Ayun. So, Pero yun nga, uh, next slide. So alam naman natin no, na yung ginagawa ng estado No, laban sa mga lumad schools, laban sa mga uh, 
teachers ng mga students ay para lang talaga patahimikin yung descent ng mga mamamayang katutubo, ng mamamayang lumad. Kaya imbis na matakot tayo, imbis na manahimik tayo, mas dapat nga tayo na mag-ingay no? at ipagpatuloy pa yung laban ng mga lumad, especially in these times no, na uh, napakalala ng atake sa mga katutubo. Mas dapat na mas marami mga kabataan ang sumanib no? sa hanay ng mga lumad, sa hanay ng mga indigenous people kasi mas ngayon kailangan no? na magkaisa tayo para mas mapalakas pa yung panawagan ng mga lumad at hindi na basta-bastang apihin ng mga uh, kasundaluhan yung ating mga kapatid na lumad. Ayun, next slide. Uh, ayun, so, yun nga, no, yung ginagawa ng mga lumad no, ay nagpapatuloy pa rin no, sa paikipaglaban, nagpapatuloy sa uh, pag-aaral no, para mapdepensahan yung kanilang mga karapatan at mapdepensahan yung kanilang lupang ninuno. Kaya naman, next slide. Ayun, bukas, yung Buckwheat School graduation din po pala ng uh, Buckwheat School. So after four years ng Buckwheat School ay tatapos na ito bukas. No? So inibitahan din namin kayo na manood no, ng uh, live cast ng Buckwheat School Grad 2021. So 2 p.m. sa Facebook page ng Save Our Schools Network. So yun po. Uh, ulit, um, maraming salamat no, sa DLSUSG no, kasi alam namin na malaki din yung nag-iambag niyo sa Bakwit School no, sa pahikibakan ng Lumad at siyempre sa Rappler no, sa pagbabalita, pag-amplify ng boses ng mga Lumad na uh, minsan lang no, na babalita sa mainstream media. So napakalaking tulong po ninyo sa pagpapalakas ng aming mga panawagan. Kaya sana ay makadalo kayo bukas. At yun po. Maraming salamat sa lahat. Ayun. As Kuya Chad said, no, matagal nang may karahasan sa mga kapatid nating lumad. Pero pinalala ng anti-terror law ang sitwasyon nila. So in terms of understanding our vulnerable sectors, I think it goes without saying that we have to understand them in proper context. So for the Lumad situation, for example, even before the anti-terror law, they have been facing a lot of persecution already. And in this, in this time, in a time of anti-terror law, it has intensified, no? What's more disappointing is the fact that they experience it from public servants who we expect to protect our interests. No? So as someone who has experienced the anti-terror law himself, we thank you for your strength, Kuya Chad, and for giving us proper context on understanding the Lumad situation and understanding the struggle of the Lumad. It goes without saying again, no? hashtag save Lumad schools. Thank you, Kuya Chad, for that presentation. It seems like we are about to enter the final leg of our webinar, the Open Forum. We now encourage everyone to raise questions for any of our speakers for today. Just a reminder, if you would like to participate or ask questions, you may use the Q&A tab below and wait for the moderator to call you. And while our viewers are thinking of questions and our speakers are getting ready to be asked, Let's talk about some of the policies the DLSU USG is working on right now. And because we conceptualized the event in commemoration of a year since the signing of the anti-terror law, what has the USG been doing, Calvin? Great question, Kat. Actually, we've noticed, no, bilang sa part ng DLSU USG, no, we've noticed that since the signing of the anti-terror law, red tagging has heightened and it became worse and worse by the day. Even the university, you know, DLSU itself got red tagged, sinabing NPA recruiter, along with other schools. Madaming schools yung nasa listahan ng sinasabing naging recruitment ko, no, ng NPA. No? With this, no, the USG is currently lobbying to have an anti-red tagging policy in the university. This is to ensure that the freedom of speech of students and their freedom to organize among themselves are protected. Wait. Um, so, so how would this work? Especially, uh, we know that uh, red tagging mostly comes from outside the university, diba? Right? Yeah, and actually, we hope that it never comes from inside the university. But we're pushing for the policy as a safeguard, na rin, no? But to clarify as well, the USG is lobbying for a policy that would protect students internally and externally. 
So internally, in a sense that we protect students, faculty, staff, and even our administrators from those threats that would come from inside the university. So for example, student-to-student -student red tagging, faculty-to-student red tagging, student-to-faculty red tagging, student-to-admin red tagging, and the like. No? For external threats naman, in our policy, we are lobbying that we are proposing protocols that would be in place. So for example, if a student gets red tagged, he would receive psychological legal, and even other forms of aid the student or the Lasallian would be needing. Grabe. And I'm very sure that a lot of us are looking forward to the passing of the anti-red uh, red tagging policy then, Calvin. Um, now, it seems like our viewers and our speakers are ready for the questions. Yes, and thank you for actually giving me time, Kath, you know, to briefly discuss the policy. With this, we now move on to the open forum. So, I request po, uh, all of our speakers to open their cameras, um, if ever, for the question and answer portion. So the first question po is for Commissioner uh, Gumpit. No? For, um, this question is, what are the elements to that chilling effect you described a while ago? How do you consider a law to have a chilling effect on our freedom of expression and humanitarian works? So how does this apply to the passage of the ATL? Well, thank you for that question. No? Uh, the fact that if you get red tag and you censor yourself already, that is a chilling effect. And then, of course, it puts you in the limelight in the wrong way. Um, and then it invites other people to vilify you as well. Uh, so those are things that will stop you from actually expressing dissent. Um, in fact, uh, there have been some cases uh, that uh, we have monitored and we have investigated as well that uh, even simple, um, uh, the youth call it ranting, no? even uh, a simple online rant about the frustration of, uh, of uh, the fact that uh, COVID or um, services because of um, COVID is not being met, no? the needs are not being met by the services of government is already something that would attract a lot of trolls, for instance. So these are things that, uh, that are really very, it's really very disturbing. And the Anti-Terror Act actually um, uh, in, in this particular um, law allows that to happen, especially those who are legitimately just raising concerns over um, issues on governance. So, um, so this is something that we have to take a uh, take a look at and uh, see, you know, and check on each other. We have to remain vigilant and try to um, to you know be in solidarity with one another. And I'm, I'm happy. I'm from La Salle, um, and I'm happy that uh, La Salle has this anti red tagging policy, and it's good because uh, you know it takes also a toll on mental health. It's not only uh, the fear of physical violence, but it's also the psychological effect no? of uh, being uh, not just called out, because anyone can be called out. No? Anyone can question our opinions, but uh, when it comes to red tagging, it has a special effect because it allows others to also attack you. No? And um, uh, as we said earlier on, and as Maria Reza said earlier on, online violence can clearly become real world violence. So we have to uh, ensure and we have to check on one another um, uh, so that everybody is safe online and offline. Thank you, Commissioner, for that. Kat, you have a question for Commissioner? Um, the next question is also for Commissioner Dumpit. Um, in regards to this, what are the substantive safeguards of the said law that protects the rights of an individual? Well, of course, it has been said here, nga, no? rights under custodial investigation, but then it seems like it uh, contradicts it because uh, you're allowed without judicial warrant to be detained for 24 days. Diba? It also talks about uh, guarding against torture, cruel, inhuman degrading treatment, but again, it contradicts it because we are not allowed to intervene. There can be um, um, 
uh, within the 24 days period um, that uh, a person can be confined or can be detained. No? So these are laws, uh, again, uh, as I've said in my presentation, these are laws that are present already in, uh, in our um, uh, revised penal code and other special laws. No? So it doesn't really introduce a new one. What, what actually introduces um, uh, the ATL, what actually it introduces is really insecurity over the fact that you can get detained, you, uh, you can be surveilled upon, uh, upon just mere suspicion and not even probable cause, uh, you can be designated as a terrorist by an executive uh, uh, council, which is not re and uh, this is this should be a uh, a judicial function as well. So yon. Um, but but just to say also that um, uh, we have to recall the Human Security Act, which is really the the Anti-Terrorism Act of old, um, which had many safeguards, human rights safeguards. And we'd like to actually say that even in our position in, the, in Congress when this was being deliberated, that they have to install those human rights safeguards. And in this case, uh, we have not seen enough of it. And uh, the human rights safeguards that were found in the Human Security Act are not any more found here. Thank you right. for that. Thank you for um, the next question. I think Calvin. Okay, so the next question is for uh, Mr. Chad Po. So uh, the question was uh, addressed in Filipino, so I'm gonna read it. Tala. So bilang isa sa mga direktang natamaan ng anti-terror law, paano malalabanan ng kabataan ang laganap na red tagging? So, paano nga ba natin malalabanan yung red tagging? Siguro ano, yung dahil nga sana banggit ko na yung habol lang naman talaga ng uh, estado sa atin ay manahimik tayo na yung tinatawag ng chilling effect no, na gusto tayong isilence, no, na matakot tayo huwag na tayong magsalita kasi baka ma-red tag tayo or huwag na tayong magsalita kasi baka may gawin sa atin. Yun talaga yung gusto mangyari to imbis na magpadala tayo sa takot no mas dapat tayong maglakas loob no para magsalita at lumaban at paano nga ba tayo makakuha ng lakas ng loob no saan ba tayo hugot ng lakas doon syempre no sa mas malawak na hanay no ng mamamayan at uh, especially doon sa mga talagang oppressed na mga sectors no tulad ng mga indigenous people kasi sa halimbawa sa akin ah uh, Andiyan talaga yung takot, no? especially dahil sa nangyari sa amin. Pero dahil alam ko na kasama ko no, yung mga lumad, alam ko na hindi nalang ako papababayaan ano man na mangyari sa akin. No, mas nagbibigay siya ng strength sa akin na lumaban, no, na wag matakot. Kaya yun din yung challenge talaga sa atin sa mga kabataan. Kasi uh, alam ko no, na sobrang nakakatakot na yun, especially sa pandemya. No? Uh, mas virtual pa yung connection natin together. Kaya talagang yung hamon sa atin na lumabas talaga tayo sa ating comfort zone no? at maghanap tayo ng talagang kasangga natin sa paikipaka which is yung uh, oppressed and vulnerable sectors so, para lumaban tayo ng mas malakas at mas marami. Yun po. Ayun, humugot ng lakas mula sa pinaglalaban natin ng mga mamamayan. Thank you for that, Kuya Chad. Now, Kat, you, uh, for the next question. Okay. Um, for the next question, um, it is for Congresswoman Sara Elago. Um, are there laws or amendments to the ATL or the Constitution that can be passed to combat red tagging? On the part of this youth representation, we filed House Bill Number 9437, which aims to penalize red tagging. Hanggang uh, six years na pagkakakulong yan uh, para po sa mga public officials na ginagamit hindi lang yung pampublikong pondo pero yung kanilang kapangyarihan uh, para mang red tag. Uh, that's, I think, the third bill no? in Congress uh, filed uh, to criminalize red tagging. Uh, the first one was filed by Representative uh, Deputy Speaker Michael Romero, the second one by Representative Joy Tambunting. 
and in the Senate no, by Senate Minority Leader Franklin Rilon. So we welcome all these measures no, to penalize red tagging and hold all those behind this state sponsored disinformation and verification responsible. And um, meron pang mga measures at katulad ng uh, a Human Rights Defenders Bill matagal na nating pinapanawagan na ito po ay maipasa. Isa sa mga mahalagang provision nito ay yung karapatan laban sa derogatory labeling. Ang kasama na dito yung red tagging dahil nga sa diskriminasyon at yung yung harm no, na nilalagay kung saan nilalagay nito o yung mga taong nagiging target. Lalong-lalo na kung paano ito nakakahadlang dun sa napakahalagang trabaho ng mga human rights defenders natin. At napakarami dyan, mga kabataan, mga estudyante na nagsasalita hindi lang para sa kanyang sektor, kundi dinadagtag yung boses niya sa mas marami pang sektor na nagtutulak no, ng kanilang mga panawagan para sa pagbabago. Andiyan din, nakapadala din sa amin nung pinakahuling version ng Comprehensive Anti-Discrimination Bill, which is now tackled before the Committee on Human Rights. So this includes, no, as one of the prohibited attributes, no, lahat ng discrimination on the basis of political beliefs and opinions. So I hope no, that the DLSUSG and all our, our partner organizations here, Grappler News PH, encourage on can stand in solidarity with us in pushing for this bill. Kung hindi man sa loob ng house, akaraniwan po may mga efforts din sa halap ng mga city councils and even sangguni ang kabataan sa harap ng mga provincial board at maski sa mga school. Napaka magandang balita po na merong anti-red tagging policy ng DLSU at naway mabahagi pa natin to sa mas maraming mga pamanta sa nagpalihi. Maraming salamat. Thank you. And uh, because of the gruesome effects of red tagging, we thank you for your representation and others who have filed legislation against red tagging. And of course, we will continuously support laws penalizing red tagging. Thank you, Congresswoman Sara Ilan. Uh, Calvin, for the next question. Okay. For the next question, this question is um, directed towards uh, Mr. Jean Tolentino from CEG. So the question is, have there been any changes in your organization's operations after the passing of the ATM? Siguro, I think yung question din dito is, may natakot ba? Um, may mga protocols ba kayo in place na binago? Um, so, have there been any changes in the organization? Ayan. Una, sa totoo yung binabanggit niya, may mga uh, hindi pinayagan ng mga parents na maging part ng CEGP and even uh, ito, yung atake na to mas ano, ramdam ng mga regional chapters. Talagang maraming mga publications na nag opt out na sumali. Kasi nga, sobrang matindi yung red tagging sa kanila. So, nung naipasa yung anti-terror law, although may mga parang uh, changes dun sa mas pag-iingat na lagi kami, ano, alimbawa sa mga headquarters, ganyan sa mga offices, paglalabas kailangan may kasama ka, ganun. Pero kung sa mismong operation ng um, ng task natin na pag-organize, mas uh, bumuo tayo ng mga plano kung paano natin dadalhin yung fight sa communities. So bumuo tayo ng uh, community journalism program para yung mga uh, campus journalists na hindi kaya na makapunta sa Manila or yung mga hindi talaga makabalik pa sa offices ay makapunta sa mga communities at mas kumalap ng information, paano nararanasan ng communities yung mga atake, uh, economic man yan o panlipunan. So, yun yung mga sinusubukan nating mas i-publish, mas paingayin. Tapos, mas nagbibuild siya ng solidarity doon sa mga uh, campus journals natin na hindi nakapagkita talaga sa loob ng school. So, kung sa, uh, may mga communities sila na magkakalapit, so, ayun yung program natin na mas makapagkita-kita sila at makabuo ng... Um, mga pieces, articles na pwede nilang uh, mas may publish. All right, thank you for that question, Regina. No, totoo nga na um, in, in a time of the anti-terror law, no, 
we must protect as well our campus publications or um the freedom of the press no kasi at the end of the day yung freedom of the press yung magiging kasangga natin sa katotohanan freedom of the press magiging kasangga natin sa mga um uh, criticisms against the government's opinions against the government so thank you for answering the question kat Okay, thank you. Oh, um, for the next, uh, for the next question, this is for all of our speakers here today. Uh, how can we, the youth, help in the initiatives of your respective organizations or affiliation? Can you re kindly repeat the question? Sorry, we didn't get it. Uh, the next question is, how can we, the youth, uh, help in the initiatives of your respective organizations and our affiliations? Uh, I, I can start by saying, yes. please, please like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, <laughs> visit our website, Makialam, uh, Maging Informed, help us fight fake news. Um, uh, uh, click before you think and make sure that uh, everyone is safe in your circle. Make sure that you also have a safe seeking behavior by reporting anything that will, uh, anything that arouses suspicion or anything that really attacks you or red tags you. That's, that's one. Um, uh, perhaps if you want to, well, register and vote. Register. There are only, what, 78 days, maybe 77 days remaining till uh, September 30, um, uh, uh, which is the deadline for uh, voter registration. Please register because that's the only way you can make change happen by making your vote count as well. And, uh, and you know, um, uh, at the end of the day, we will elect the government we deserve. So uh, if we want to deserve a government that will lead us into the future, then uh, go vote wisely, vote your conscience, vote for the future that you want. Thank you for that, um, you. Commissioner Gumpet. Um, how about the other speakers, if you would like to also answer the question? Hello. Uh, siguro sa amin sa CEGP, yung unang panawagan natin, suportahan natin yung mga campus publications natin. Uh, kung may mga pubs tayo sa schools natin, mag-join tayo. Tapos, syempre, yung isa ay uh, sign our manifesto, yung campus press demand. Uh, nasa page lang namin yun. Tapos, um, syempre, um, kung di kay, wala kayong publication sa school ay... Um, pwede kayo mag-join ng CEGP bilang uh, volunteer. Tapos uh, sa mga publication, lalo na sa Lasal, ayun, be a member publication po ng CEGP para mas uh, makakonect tayo doon sa iba't iba pa natin mga activities and advocacy. Ayun. Salamat po. Ako naman po. Let's go lang. Ayan, so mga kabataan, be brave. May mga kasama kayo, hindi kayo nag-iisa no, sa paghahangad na magkaroon ng justisya, pananagutan, ng pagtatanggol sa karapatang pantao at demokrasya dito sa ating bansa. Uh, sa loob ng mga eskwelahan, work with your faculty members, guidance counselor, your university admin, no, palakihin pa natin yung pagkakaisa na yan. Hindi lang sa loob ng school natin, pero sa iba't iba pang mga communities. Sa sinabi rin kanina ni Regina, mukha nga din natin na palakasin no, yung linkages ng kung, ng kung paano ba nagsisilbi din yung ating sistema ng edukasyon, yung education stakeholders para ma-uplift naman no, yung kabuhayan. Hindi lang yung mismo mga sudyante at members ng isang school community, no, kundi ng mas marami pa nating mga kababayan, dalang lalo na ngayon sa gitna ng pandemia. Get organized. Um, in uh, supporting you know, our legislative measures, uh, standing up for human rights, from human rights education, hanggang sa critical media and information literacy, hanggang sa peace studies. Sobrang kailangan natin yan. Take the lead in uh, opening up 
opening up more spaces online and offline to discuss all these issues. Let's continue the public conversation. And uh, asusugan ko po, supportahan ko yung panawagan ng ating mga naunang tagapagsalita. A register to make our vote count. Your vote matters. Your voice matters. I-register po. Magparehistro tayo, hindi lang upang makaboto, kundi magrehistro po po tayo ng boses natin sa iba't ibang issue na kinakaharap ngayon ng mga kabataan at ng ating mga kabayan. Kaya muli, uh, you're not alone. Uh, kasama niyo po ang representasyon na ito, ang lahat ng narito no, na magtutulungan at magkakaisa no, para dun sa hinahangad natin na hinabukasan at uh, sa pinakamalapit na kasalukuyan na meron tayong pagrespeto at pagtatanggol na sa dignidad at karapatan ng bawat pili. Maraming salamat. Thank you for that, uh, Congresswoman Sara. And before we move to um, Kuya Chad answering the questions, una, we want to say thank you po to Commissioner Karen for attending this webinar today. Um, si Com Karen po ay may pupuntahan pa pong meeting kaya I think she has to leave now. So thank you, thank you, thank you po. Thank for you, the, maraming uh, salamat for your time. Uh, Keep safe, register, and vote in the next elections. Thank you. Yes, well, thank, thank you. you for that. Po. All right. Okay. Um, with that, uh, Kuya Chad, I think we can move to you. Ayun. Uh, so kung paano nga ba makatulong yung kabataan no, sa Favor Schools Network, sa Lumad Schools and Community, siguro sa ngayon yung pinakakailangan talaga, no? ng mga lumad communities ay yung pag-amplify no, ng boses ng mga lumad especially na uh, yung mga lumad yung pinapatahimik yung mga lumad yung mga hindi pinapakinggan kaya ngayon yun, yun talagang challenge sa atin yung task sa atin ng mga kabataan especially na nasa social media palagi may mga connection sa media ganyan uh, kailangan nating uh, bigyan ng platform no, yung mga lumad hiramin natin sila no, na ating mga platform no. So <clears throat> ayun na uh, especially ngayon, halimbawa ngayon na uh, may hinuli ulit na lumad leader na no, sa Mindanao. No, ibalita natin, i-retweet, like, share no yung mga statements uh, about sa mga ganitong mga cases no? kasi kung hindi, talagang malilibing lang sa limot yung kwento ng mga lumad no, yung kwento ng mga harassment. Kaya nasa atin po yung responsibility, yung role no, yung papel para uh, malagay ulit no sa mapa no yung mga lumad at hindi lang sila basta makalimutan at mailibing sa limot yun lang po amplify the lumad struggle maraming salamat okay um Tama, you, no i think uh, kailangan din ma-highlight no sorry <laughs> kailangan din ma-highlight yung sinabi ni Kuya Chad no na amplify no yung bosses ng mga lumad wag natin kalimutan na yung mga lumad or people who are struggling as well no be in different struggles may bosses ang mga tao may bosses ang mga nagsu-struggle what we need to do is amplify them no amplify their voices amplify their calls support their cause so thank you for that for your chat okay so for our next question i think it's um for also, well, also for everyone, Calvin. Okay, for our next question, uh, this question is for everyone who, who wants to answer as well. So would you say that the effects of the law goes beyond the immediate literal arrests that have cited it as a basis and extend more broadly to the increased space there is now for the government to persecute and red tag activists and militarize communities with impunity? Okay, to repeat the question, would you say that the effects of the law go beyond the immediate literal arrests that have been cited, it as a basis, and extend more broadly to the increased space there is for now for the government to persecute and red tag activists and militarize communities with impunity? Right. Anyone can go for it. Anyone can go first, Bob. Hey, hello. Uh, siguro ma uh, relate ko siya sa nangyari sa amin. No? Kasi kami, hinuli kami at kinasuhan. Hindi naman terror law yung kinasa sa amin. No? Kidnapping, uh, human trafficking, child abuse. No? Pero yung paraan no? 
yung paghuli at saka yung parang underlying basis niya na kami daw ay mga terorista, ganyan. So, ito yung laging uh, binibring up ng mga kapulisan na habang nasa custodian na lang kami, na, na kami ay mga terorista. Tapos, especially ngayon, hindi na kayo makakalabas kasi may terror lang ganyan, ganyan. So, uh, talagang tama no, yung kuha na hindi lang siya basta dun sa yung parang uh, kung ano yung nakasulat mismo dun sa kuhan sa batas no? kundi parang naglagay lang sila ng kuhan ng batas na yan no? para takutin yung mamamayan at para may ibang basis sila no? to illegally arrest uh, people no? na lumalaban against sa kanila mga anti-people na mga policies Yes, just to add, we've also seen in the past year how uh, search warrants are being weaponized uh, to justify and legitimize illegal leads and arrest activists, activists unionists, human rights defenders, and um, to intensify the crackdown against uh, dissenters and vocal opposition. So, good news naman para sa lahat na, na binasura ng Corte Suprema nito lang nakaraang alinggo no yung kapangyarihan na uh, Manila at UC executive judges na mag-issue ng search warrant sa labas ng kanilang judicial regions mahalaga ito na development no? because of uh, these illegal raids and arrests uh, through uh, the factory of search warrants resulted to uh, the deaths no of about nine in the Tumandok tribe nine activists and unionists in southern Tagalog, and the arrest no, of countless, uh, many more uh, trade union leaders. Kaya, wag na, dapat natin hayaan na ginagamit yung, yung batas para imbes na protektahan yung karapatan ng mamamayan, ginagamit pa ito no, para ipagkait sa kanila yung karapatan nila na magsalita, magpahayag, at ipaglaban ang kanila. Hello? Eh dagdag ko lang yung kanina binanggit ko rin na ano yung sa anti terror law di ba kapalit siya nung pag approve ng US doon sa arms bill ni Duterte so kapag nakita natin na yung yung mismong arms bill na ano nila na between sa kanilang dalawa gagamitin at gagamitin yun para mang terrorize lalo ng mga community lalong lalo na halimbawa yung binanggit mo siya sa mga lumad tapos ano ba yung ano yung rason bakit halimbawa even yung Marawi di ba yung nagkaroon ng crisis diyan na meron daw na ayun yung isang rationale nila eh bakit kailangan ng anti-terror law eh para subpuin daw yung mga terorista ganyan pero sa actual yung pagkasira ng mismong siyudad ng Marawi yung naging effect niyan pinasok siya nung ano eh nung parang corporate extraction di ba ng mga uh, may interest dun sa lugar dun sa yaman ng lugar so Nakita natin na bukod dun sa mismong batas na nagbilify ng dissent, tumatagos talaga siya dun sa communities at kailangan nating makita na yung anti-terror law, economic talaga yung ano niya, yung implications niya. Pinoprotektahan niya yung corporate greed. Na kung sino man yung pumigil sa uh, halimbawa ng mga nag-union na mga labor leader, sino man yung pumigil o oh, sino man yung mag-union itatag as terrorist. Halimbawa sa mga Coca-Cola workers, di ba? Dahil pinaglalaban nila yung right nila against dun sa grid ng corporation, tinatag sila as uh, mga NPA, di ba? Kaya kailangan makita natin na bukod dun sa pag stifle ng dissent natin bilang mga nasa hanay ng mga professionals, economic yung implication niya para sa mga pesante, para sa lupa, di ba? So economic talaga siya para sa mga, mga manggagawa, mga magsasaka. So ayun po. All right. Thank you, Paul, from our speak for uh, from our speakers to, for answering the question. Kat. Okay. So for the next question, uh, this question was already answered by Commissioner Dompit in the Zoom chat. But for everyone here who would like to answer the question further, this question is from uh, Felisa Faranda, and it goes: ATL has undeniably pursued national security at the expense of citizens' civil and political liberties. This issue alone is not new, as seen in, uh, in Singapore and Malaysia's ISA or International Security Act. 
it appears that sta uh, statutes that uh, aim to counter terrorism have the vulnerability of constricting the democratic space. With the ATL's enactment, is it uh, is its entire repeal the solution? And what are the available formal channels where we can contend its overly broad provisions to be more specific? Uh, anyone uh, can go first. Hello. Yan. Tingin lang natin yes. ano yung uh, meron sa student council elections before no nag-cover yung pub. Yung isang uh, natutunan natin doon, wag natin wag tayo pumasok sa arena nung kaaway. Kailangan natin siyang tunggalin hindi lang parang hindi para ano eh, tama na china challenge natin yung provision sobrang vague niya pero ang panawagan talaga natin ibasura yung batas as in scrap the, uh, the law hindi talaga parang particular power kasi ano siya eh, yung mismong batas niya na ginawa hindi talaga siya para sa mamamayan wala siyang anything na talaga makakatulong and kung di ba nga yung binanggit natin na anti terror law Sobrang dami na nating mga batas na nandiyan na para dun sa mga particularities na binabanggit. Kasi clearly, yung mismong batas na yun, ginawa talaga siya para sa uh, pag ano nila, pag uh, incorporate nila nung mismong law o paglilegalize nila ng uh, nung mga whole of nation na mga approaches nila. So, ayun, uh, ang panawagan talaga natin, uh, mas magkaisa para ipanawagan yung batas. Tapos mas Ano siya eh. Kasi nga diba galing din siya sa Human Security Act na uh, sa panahon pa ni Gloria. Tapos nung panahon na yun, uh, may tama, tama rin naman yung point dun sa, ano eh, sa tanong na nung Human Security Act, meron pa siyang mga safeguard katulad ng yung 500,000, ba diba? Pero ngayon tinanggal siya. So siguro yung mas ay panawagan natin talaga yung mas, syempre yung pangunahin ay ibasura talaga yung bata. Sunod yung parang ano eh, yung Tinutulak nila na may mga safeguard pero sa actual wala. So tuloy-tuloy dapat natin expose na ganun yung ganun kasahol yung batas na to at wala siyang lugar para sa constitution natin. Thank you for answering the question Regina. Uh, Congresswoman Sarah would want to answer. Yes. I'm also one of the petitioners against ATN and we're really hoping that it will be repealed. Uh, so we're at organizing more pocket um, actions you know, to really uh, continue you know, spaces for information and education on uh, the prospects of APL and the matter of addressing the push and pull factors affecting uh, uh, terrorism. Sa part ng kabataan, that's unemployment, poverty, injustice, and corruption, marginalization. So, yun yung mga bagay na sa tingin natin dapat uh, doon nakafocus, na hindi doon sa very militaristic approach. Red tagging does not solve the roots of armed conflict. Uh, and we echo, we support the call of, of say up then, you know, that in order, uh, instead of red tagging educational institutions, youth and student leaders, the government must really address the root causes of armed struggle in the country. As a youth rep, no, we also filed a manifestation before the Interparliamentary Union uh, because of APL, as uh, this really um, sponsors a self-censorship among legislators and uh, also creates a chilling effect on Congress members. As for uh, support to the manifestations of human rights groups before the UN Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner, on human rights, youth and student organizations here that can also get in touch with this youth representation to bring before the committee their manifestations, reports, or unity statements on threats to their fundamental freedoms and the exercise of academic freedom, freedom to, to think, no? freedom uh, to question, freedom of thought expression opinion in our schools as it relates to the right of education. Pwede po natin maipahatid yan sa harap ng mga bodies na ito. Sa pinakahuli, uh, pinakakinakailangan talaga 
sobrang halaga na hindi lang naiiwan sa loob ng universities and colleges yung pag-uusap tungkol sa mga topics na to. Uh, kung pwede din tayong pag-explore ng ways kung paano makaka-discuss to or maibabahagi ito sa ating mga communities, no? o mismo sa loob ng ating tahanan. Sobrang halaga niya. Para sa, hindi lang sa kamulatan, no? pero sa pag sa pagtulong at paggabay sa bawat isa na magkaroon ng informed na decision at position pagdating sa pagtatanggol ng ating mga. Thank you for that, Congresswoman Sarah. Kuya Chad, would you have anything to add? Uh, Alright, sige. Um, I think we are down to our last part of the open forum. And this uh, last part naman of the open forum would be to ask the speakers, no? would you guys have any final words for our viewers and attendees today? No, I think we can start with um, Congresswoman Sarah, then Kuya Chad, then Ms. Regina. No? Um, would you have any final words po for our viewers and our speakers for today? Ang atake sa isa sa atin ay atake no, sa lahat. An attack in one of us is an attack on all of us. So, uh, napakahalaga ng solidarity. Napakahalaga ng pagpapakita na sa bawat isa ng suporta pagdating sa pagpapahayag ng mga karainan ng mga pangarap ng bawat Pilipino. Uh, kaya, ngayon na yung panahon na para ipakita yan. Now more than ever, we really need to rely on the power of our collective action. We need to afford you know, greater solidarities you know, to not only build back better, but to build back better. Kaya sa lahat ng narito, uh, stay healthy, stay informed, and let's continue to look after each other's health and well-being. Hindi lang sa pansarili, no, kundi sa ating buong komunidad at buong bayan. Maraming salamat at mabuhay po kayo. BLSUUSG, Rappler Move PH. Indeed, let's hold the line courage on. Thank you, Congresswoman Sarah. Kuya Chad? Ayun, uh, tulad nga na nabangit kanina no, na kailangan natin na magkaisa. No? Kung yung NTFL ka systematic ko niya ginagawa yung red tagging, yung panunupil ng boses ng mamamayan. Dapat tayo din ang mga kabataan, systematic ko at organisado, organisado din tayong kumikilos no? para uh, ma-achieve natin yung mga goals natin at syempre no, maitsan yung takot na bitbit natin no? dahil sa political climate na gustong gawin or ipamukha ng estado sa atin. Kaya the more na tinatakot na tayo, mas the more tayong dapat na mga hat at makibaka. Kaya yun, sumapit tayo sa mga organizations no, para systematiko natin labanan yung ginagawa ng Estado. Yun lang po, makibaka. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Kuya Chad. Ms. Regina po. Ayan. Siguro iwan ko lang yung quote na ano, no, uh, parang only through militant struggle can the best in the youth emerge. Dahil yung message ko naman today para sa mga student leaders, lahat halos ng mga leader natin hanggang sa kasalukuyan ay napanday sa kabataan nila. Kaya hanggat mga kabataan tayo, uh, sanayin na natin yung sarili nating makiisa, uh, makilahok tayo at most importantly, tayo yung manguna palagi. So, ayun. Maraming salamat po sa uh, DLSU, sa Rappler, sa pag -iimbita. And thank you for uh, to all our speakers for those wonderful words. no So, ang atake sa ating ay, ang atake sa isa ay atake sa ating lahat. Kailangan sistematiko at organisado tayo na kumikilos. At the more na tinatakot tayo, dapat the more na tayo mga has. Only through militant struggle can the best in the youth emerge. Thank you for those quotable quotes you have given to us today. And actually, that ends our open forum for today. I hope that everyone was satisfied by the answers of our speakers. Indeed, Calvin. But like all good things, everything must eventually come to an end. To formally end this event, we call on Annie, uh, Anna Dolor Guevara, one of the project heads of Hashtag Defend Democracy, to give her closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Kat. 
Uh, we would like to once again acknowledge and give our heartfelt thanks to our dear guest speakers, Commissioner Karen Gomez Dumpit, Congresswoman Sara Elago, Mr. Gina Tolentino, and Mr. Chad Poo, and most especially to Ms. Maria Reza, who gave her time and effort to be our keynote speaker for today's forum. We also thank you, the participants here in the Zoom space, our viewers in our live stream, our companions in Defending Democracy. During our first day of Hashtag Defend Democracy, we were able to look back on what has happened since the anti-terror bill was signed into law. We hope that you were able to learn from our guest speakers who are in the forefront of this fight for democracy and experienced firsthand the threat of this law. A point I'd like us to reflect on. Are we truly free? Now that we have established how the ones in power have taken advantage of our vulnerability during this pandemic, and even before, we must know how this law poses a threat to our democracy. Now it is imperative that we ask these questions to ourselves, these questions to ourselves and our fellow countrymen. Are we really free? The rampant right tagging, unceasing transgression of human rights, and weaponization of law against our own people say otherwise. In a country where dissent puts your life at risk, critics are silenced, and the Filipino people are harassed. And the Filipino people are harassed for their resistance. I question the freedom we possess. Gaya nga ng kasabihan, hindi ka tunay na malaya, mahaba lang ang tanikala. As we try to free ourselves from this deeply rooted chain of manipulation and control, the state slowly chokes the air of freedom from our nation until nobody can speak in the vacuum it has created. We know our democracy is under attack. We know our freedom comes at a price. But now that we know, what do we do to defend democracy? Filipinos are known for resiliency not just in the face of calamities but even more so in times of injustice, inequality, and oppression. Like what Congresswoman Sara shared, our strength is in our unity and solidarity. In fact, our own history tells us that the power is in the people through our collective resistance. This looming threat to their fragile authority is exactly why this, they silence dissent and call every form of resistance a threat to the state. It is imperative now, more than ever, we resist to defend democracy. We must remember that the state's mandate is to serve the people and their election has only granted them a fraction of their collective power that we, the Filipino people, possess. We defend democracy more so than ever for the victims of the anti-terror law. We defend democracy for our indigenous people, the Aitas from Zambales, the Lumad communities, and all the victims of militant state attacks. We defend democracy for those who fight for the truth in the media industry, the ABS-CBN network, and all journalists that, we have for, that have been forcibly silenced. We defend democracy for activists who tenaciously call out and fight against the injustices in our society. We defend democracy for the most vulnerable, the last, the lost, and the least. And we defend democracy for the silenced and oppressed, speaking with the voice we have before we cannot speak at all. As we end day one of hashtag defend democracy, I want to leave you all with a few questions to ponder on. Why is this happening? And what can we do to defend democracy? As you reflect on these questions, come join us tomorrow for day two of hashtag defend democracy where we will talk about the fight against anti-terror law and tackle those very questions. Once again, I'd like to thank the speakers for today's forum, Commissioner Karen Gomez Dumpit, Congresswoman Sara Elago, Ms. Regina Tolentino, Mr. Chad Boo, and Ms. Maria Reza. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming today as we defend democracy. Cheers to fighting for our freedom, something that they can never take away. Thank you for that, Anna. For all our viewers today, please remain silent for our opening, uh, for our closing prayer to be led by everyone, Clarice Santa Anna.
Let us remember that we are in the most holy presence of God for the Catholics in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you've called us to serve for others. Thank you, Lord, for a very successful webinar. May you keep blessing us as we continue to defend democracy and use our collective power to build a nation that is rooted and centered in social justice, respect for human rights, and democracy. May you give us the wisdom to fully understand the issues surrounding our society and how we can apply all of our learnings into concrete action. Grant that we do not do this for ourselves, but for the service of the people. Altogether, our Lasallian prayer, I will continue, oh my God, to do all my actions for the love of you. St. John Baptist de La Salle, pray for us. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for that, Anna and Clarice, for officially ending our event. We would also like to thank all our viewers and all the speakers who graced us in this event today. Thank you, for, to, thank you to Rappler and to the Courage On Coalition for making this possible. Once again, I'm Kat Duyan. And I am Calvin Almazan, and we were your hosts for today. Don't forget to register for day two of hashtag De Defend Democracy through the link that will be sent in the comment section below. Always choose to fight for what is right and always choose to defend democracy. Throughout history, it was proven that we have always persevered in times of great struggle. The history of the Filipino is a history of resistance and of victory. See you tomorrow. Animo Lasal.